Good evening and welcome to tonight's uh, Board of Education meeting. Um, first thing I'd ask people to do is turn off their cell phones, please. They interfere with our feed for the TV. And then secondly, I'd ask you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. And to start our meeting, I'd ask the uh, secretary to call the roll. Or I can do it. Vice President, call the roll. <laughs> <laughs> OK, President Wasserman, yeah. Vice President Branstad, I'm here. Secretary Baker is absent this evening. Treasure Singer. Here. Member Frizee. Here. Member Gorton. Here. And Member McFarlane. Here. We have six out of seven. Thank you very much. Uh, the first item on our agenda is the consent agenda. If you've looked at the consent agenda prior to the meeting, you can see the list of, uh, of items that are on it. Some retirement resignations, uh, food service contract with Chartwell's renewal of a five, second year, first year of a first renewal of a five-year contract. <coughs> uh, our Yo and Yo audit renewal, they've served us well. And we have a new auditor there uh, that brings a set of fresh eyes. Um, and approval of school payment bills for February and legal invoices uh, for the month, $336. Any additions uh, or subtractions from the consent agenda desired? See none, I'll entertain a motion for acceptance. I'll move to accept consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.7 as identified in the agenda. Support. Moved by Scott, support by Angela. Any comments or questions? See no one take a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. This is the point of the agenda where we move into request to address the board. We have several people requesting tonight, and I believe Representative Glenn is the first one to the podium. Um, as he approaches, we request people limit their comments to five minutes and state their school attendance area or where they live in the district uh, so people know where they're from. And the clock is there to help with your five minutes. That work? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gary Glenn, I appreciate this opportunity. I just wanted to come the first time I've attended, uh, having been elected, just to uh, reintroduce myself and also give you all the contact information that you might have. And for anybody in the audience and watching on television, we have a toll free number, which is 855. Glenn with two N's, G L E N N nine eight. I represent the ninety eighth district, which includes the city of Midland and six townships adjacent to the city of Midland in Midland County, and then seven townships over in Bay County. So eight five five Glenn ninety eight. Um, want to assure you that uh, on a regular basis, uh, on these evenings throughout the year, I'm going to attend as many of these meetings as possible. If I'm not here, then perhaps my chief of staff, Mike Goshka who is a former chairman of the Senate Higher Education Subcommittee, was six years in the House and eight years in the State Senate. So uh, if you can't get me, you can get Mike. Maybe you're better off uh, if you call during the week when I'm in session and those kind of things, because Mike's got a lot of experience. Uh, and uh, his wife is a public school teacher uh, down in uh, Saginaw County. Uh, right now is the point, Mr. Chairman, where I would report to you that the budgets are being set and it's my judgment, even only having been on the job for about two months, that it will be easier to influence the process now than it will be after the budgets have gone through a certain point in the process. But uh, the uh, subcommittees of the Appropriations Committee are considering the budgets right now. And as I have offered to Superintendent Shero, if you want to make sure nothing is lost in communication, I am happy to sign a letter to the chairman of the uh, K through 12 Education Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee if you would like to draft it to make sure we don't lose anything. And specifically, I've addressed the question of Midland being among those privileged districts, which uh, that's the term that's actually used, privileged districts to have actually gotten a net uh, decrease in this year's budget. Uh, I'm told that's not going to happen this year. But I'm the kind of guy that doesn't want to take things for granted. I want to make sure and lock it down. So I'm told that right now is the time to be communicating that with the subcommittee before it gets past the subcommittee process to the full committee. Then we come up with a budget. It's much harder to change after the fact. So if you'd like to work with me in drafting whatever message you would like to be sent to the budgeting process at this point, I am happy 
to uh, sign such a letter on behalf of the Midland School District. Also, uh, it is the uh, highest priority of both the House and the Senate Republican caucuses, at least, to repeal Michigan's prevailing wage law. And I have introduced uh, legislation which currently has about 25 co-sponsors that would repeal the prevailing wage law specifically re with regard to school construction. Uh, Anderson Economics in Lansing, which is a nonpartisan e economist, estimated that we would save $223 million a year on public school construction alone if we did not have the prevailing wage law, which for the sake of the viewers is one that says that if we're going to build an elementary school here in Midland, we can't simply put it out to bid and take the best bid price, the best qualified bidder, but because tax dollars are being spent, we have to pay prevailing union benefits and wages that are set in more metropolitan areas such as Flint or Detroit. Uh, the estimate is that with that kind of savings, we could have built an additional 300 elementary schools in Michigan over the last decade for no more than we spent on building the school buildings we have now. And I believe that of the available funding from the state general fund, that that money ought to be spent on the kids in the classroom and not on putting up bricks and mortar of the classrooms around them. So, so this, those are some of the issues that we uh, have had before us in Lansing. I'm happy to stand for any questions you may have. I will be here on a rotating basis. There are other, um, other townships and city councils and, and villages that meet on Monday nights. So in rotation, you'd see me, you know, maybe once or twice a year. But if you ever need me for something in, uh, in particular, on a particular occasion, all you got to do is ask. And I'll, I'll certainly be here. So with that, Mr. Chairman, if you have any questions, uh, happy to answer them. If you don't, looks like you've got a full audience tonight that wants to talk to you about <coughs> something else. Um, and I'm going to stick around and listen to that as well. I think we're good. I, I would comment, uh, Gary, uh, thank you for your diligence and attention to the funding issues and your knowledge of what happened to us last year or this current budget year. And we welcome you listening to our concerns and needs as we go forward for the sake of the audience. Lansing determines how much money we get. And uh, lest you think we do, uh, they do. And so having that input uh, to Mr. Glenn is very valuable. We are scheduled to meet with you and Senator Stamas on Friday, I believe it is. And we will have outlined for you at that point exactly what our concerns are on the governor's proposal that's right. sitting there. Right. And uh, that will allow you to take that back in a strong and defined fashion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, Thank Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Now we open it up to others who have asked to address the board. But before I do that, um, I know why you're all here. Uh, it's been communicated to us. And so rather than have a lot of people come up and speak to a lot of issues, I think it's very valuable to clarify what the reality situation is, what the true is is, so that people understand what that is versus what uh, has been quite a rapid, uh, for lack of a better word, rumor flying. And I would uh, like to cut that rumor off at least for what we can give facts. So I may disagree with the facts. That's, that's different than disagreeing with the rumors. So I'm going to hand it to Mike and let him tell you where we're at with the fifth grade music and, and where, it's, where it's going and what we're trying to do. First, I would like to say this is great to have at any yeah. school board meeting. Yes. Many people interested <laughs> in ed education is a good thing. So, um, you know, that's, that's the first thing. But I do believe uh, uh, maybe many of you came under the wrong pretenses because um, yesterday afternoon um, I received an email in regards to um, the, the music boosters encouraging <coughs> citizens to show up tonight because of changes to the music program. And I guess as a superintendent of schools, I was taken back as I. Um, the two years, the 21 months that I've been here, there's been no changes that we've made to the music programs at Midland, nor are we planning to make any changes to the music programs in, in Midland Public Schools. So th that was quite a bit of a surprise to me. But today, um, came in, we began to do lots of work because I read, the, read what was being said in there and wanted to make sure I knew what was occurring in the district, what was going on out there. And so the concern seemed to be about fifth, fifth grade music and the changes, some changes there. I asked about scheduling practices in our, throughout our history uh, in fifth grade music, and it has always been where, where the program has occurred sometimes, uh, or part of the time before and after school, part of the time if possible during the day, depending on the staffing of the music people, where they move, the size of the school, what's occurring on in each of those schools throughout the district. 
Um, so I looked at that, and that is the case. And so I, I see a, a, a sheet that was passed out tonight that said that we've always had a portion of it during the day. That's a, that's not completely accurate. We've had it a portion of the day in all, excuse me, in the district every year, but not in every building. There are always been have been buildings that did not have it during the day, depending on what occurred during that time. Then I pulled the numbers, and, and I wanted to see if um, that really was seen a decline in the numbers throughout the program. Our band, choir, and orchestra numbers in the sixth grade, and I took sixth grade because obviously fifth grade would um, affect sixth grade if we were seeing a decline in those numbers going through the years. And we saw, um, if you compared, we compared them a number of years, but to, to keep it simple tonight, we compared 1314 to 1415, and if you did that, our overall numbers in the district, and, and I'll read them off to you, Band in the 13-14 was 195 students participating in the sixth grade. And in the 14-15 year, it was 207. It actually increased uh, participation. Choir in the sixth grade and 13-14 school year was 143. In the 14-15 year, it was 190. It actually increased. In orchestra in the sixth grade, it was 71 students participated. And then this school year, it, it was 93. So it increased. All three of them increased from 13-14 to 14-15. 15-16, it's a bit early. But if we compare to there, they're in, in ex almost the exact same ballpark numbers as the 14-15 or 13-14 school year. And we're still not done because there's school of choice applications and students move entering into sixth grade from the elementary schools through. So those numbers are somewhat incomplete as we go through. So I guess I, you know, I was a bit surprised to hear this when, um, in, in future. So I thought maybe you know I made it clear that um, we have a deficit budget. We've been spending our um, fund balance down for a number of years, and that there's going to be budget reductions throughout the school year. We've been doing budget reductions throughout this school year. Most most of you have not even noticed them as we've gone through. And so I thought, well, maybe they're presuming that um, fifth grade music must be on, on that issue. And I can tell you that we've got those prepared and we're ready to move forward here as the budget season comes and fifth grade music has never been mentioned on those budget reductions. And so I hope that sets the tone for tonight uh, before you speak and, and gives you accurate information of what we have. One of the things I would propose since there seems to be some concern out there about the music is that um, this week or next week I'll send one of our administrators out. We'll meet with the music boosters, uh, music uh, um, teachers in the district and talk about these issues, show the numbers that we have, and let's take a look at those. But I certainly was surprised yesterday to see that email flying out there. Good thing. Thanks, Mike. Uh, first of all, for the board, any questions on what Mike had to say in terms of details, et cetera? No. Okay. And with that, then I would ask people if they wish to still speak to come to the, the podium. I have several that are pre-scheduled, and I'll announce them. Again, uh, to say your school attendance area. And, uh, and your five minutes, please, so in case there's lots of folks that want to speak. And the first person on the roster is Rick Shaheen. <clears throat> Good evening, my school attendance area. I'm Rick Shaheen, is Chestnut Hill, Northeast, Midland High. I teach at Dow High. I get around. <laughs> Not something I probably want to televise, but okay. Um, I have a letter, actually, from someone who couldn't be here tonight, and I'd like to read that on behalf of that individual um, with a couple of follow-ups. Dear Midland Public Schools Board of Education, my name is Christopher Charbonneau, and I have been a band director in the state of Michigan for 22 years. I am the director of music at the University of Detroit Jesuit High School and Academy. I am fortunate to teach in one of the finest schools in the Midwest. I had every intention of coming up from Detroit to be at this meeting tonight, but our school's basketball team is making a run for the state title, having just one district. We have a game tonight that I must attend. Besides my duties as a music educator, I also am the moderator for our student senate and need to support and oversee our 900 plus young men as they cheer on our team. As an adjudicator or judge for the Michigan School Band and Orchestra Association, I have had the privilege of hearing the bands and orchestras from the Midland schools for about the past 12 years at district festivals. I am invited to MSBOA District 5 to evaluate the bands and orchestras from schools in mid-Michigan. I am always honored and humbled to be invited to your area each year. Each year that I hear the high school and middle school groups from your school district, I am always very impressed. 
I hear groups from all across the state as I travel around to different MES, MSBOA districts to adjudicate. Without question, you have some of the very finest bands and orchestras in the state of Michigan. For years, I have educated the many, many music teachers that I know across the state about the incredible groups that Midland has. The word has spread for sure, as many of my colleagues mentioned, your two high school band programs as some of Michigan's best. There are several reasons for your program success. The two that I want to mention are your incredibly supportive parents and your teachers. Each year at festival, the parents of your hundreds and hundreds of young musicians come out and support their talented children. When I am judging in the sight reading room, I always make a point to thank the parents and tell them of the caliber of the program. They are always appreciative and receptive. The emotional support and the love that they have for their kids in the music program are very sincere and beautiful to see. Most school districts would be happy to have one music teacher who is considered a master teacher in a generation, as they are hard to come by. In Midland, you have several. I will mention just a few here, all of whom have earned accolades statewide from their peers. Bill Monroe has been a dedicated band director for many years at Midland High School. His bands are always prepared, and the rapport that he has with the students is obvious and a joy to see. Bill is a true master teacher. Kathy Peretz is one of the finest band and orchestra teachers I have ever known. Her commitment and dedication to teaching and to your school district is inspiring to see. Her students love her, and she is the very definition of a master teacher. Again, you have many more than I could mention, such as Roger Stevens and retired Jim Huber, but I will talk about just one more here. Steve DeReese at Midland Dow High School, in my mind, is one of the best of the best. His top high school group recently played at the Michigan Music Conference in Grand Rapids. This is the single highest honor that an ensemble from Michigan can receive. Imagine being a young musician and performing in front of hundreds of Michigan's finest band and orchestra directors. Your high school band members from Dow High School did, and they received a standing ovation from the toughest critics out there. It was a well-deserved ovation, as they sounded like a collegiate group. I mention all of this so that you're aware as board members that the success that your music program has had is not just a City of Midland success story. It is broader than that. So I ask all of you to consider what will happen to that success if cuts are made at the elementary level to this program. The high school groups are excellent playing groups because the feeder program is just as stellar. That feeder system includes your middle school programs and teachers and your elementary band and orchestra programs. Listen to your music teachers who have built this program over many years before changes are made to balance a budget. They are the experts in music education and I know they will work with you and the administration to make it work. These incredible teachers certainly deserve it, but more importantly, the music students in the Midland schools deserve it. They are amongst the very best in our state and ultimately, this is about them. Imagine how the varsity football coach would react if the roots of his program were cut. It is the younger students that teachers need to help shape and form into, the successful, te into successful teenagers. Let your incredible staff of music teachers continue to do their jobs. They are dedicated, loving, and driven people who are everything that music education is about. I again apologize for not being there in person. If you ever want to discuss this, I would be happy to come up and meet with any or all of you this spring. I would take a personal day from school if needed because I believe that every aspect of your program is worth continuing. We need programs like Midland to have continued success in our great state. Most sincerely, Chris Charbonneau, Music Director, U of D Jesuit High School and Academy, Camp Director, Wolverine Summer Band Camp, Adjudicator, Clinician, Guest Conductor. Now, a couple of points that Mr. Charbonneau also wanted to make since what we've heard tonight is that maybe we don't have anything to worry about but there's a stronger correlation between music education and learning achievement than there is between sports and learning achievement. And we generally don't have paranoia about sports cuts. And some people don't have the question, why are the band parents here? There's reason to be paranoid statewide. Music tends to be under the gun more than most. And if, it's, if it is, as indeed it is, a better learning opportunity, and if it's stable, maybe it should be enhanced so that it's offered to more children. Um, it was unfortunate and I'm glad Representative Glenn brought up the point that we're considered a privileged district. I think it should be normal that districts across the state should have a music program to match this. Maybe their academics would match this because it's very clear that the students in Midland who have access to music have, have excelled academically as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Again. Yeah, yeah. And before we go to the next person, I would reiterate there are no plans to cut 
fifth grade music. So uh, it's, I, hate, I hate to say this again, but uh, feel free to come to the podium. You still feel you need to. And the next person is, I gotta read my writing here with my, Kevin Bauck. <clears throat> Good evening. Oops. Uh, I am Kevin Bauck. I am the uh, president of Dow High Music Boosters Club, uh, school district Seabird, Jefferson, Dow. Um, Standing here to my left is uh, Shannon Kruger. She's the president of the Midland High uh, School Parent Music Parents Association, and she'll be speaking after me. Hopefully, she'll get five minutes as well if she needs it. Um, so you're probably saying, well, why are high school music parents boosters here? Uh, worrying about or concerned about fifth grade music. Um, first of all, the, there is no parent organization or uh, voice given to fifth grade uh, parents, and so somebody has to speak on their behalf if, in fact, there are or are not issues. Um, at least there's concerns. I, I think that's fair to say. Um, but I think the other thing is that uh, high school parents have unique perspective on the music programs because they've watched their kids go through it. And so I think that there's great value in the MPS music program, and again, that's what I, we see. So first of all, it's a thing that allows every student to participate, no matter what their background is or what their ability is. It's very inclusive, as you probably know. It's already been mentioned here, too, about the link between music education and academic success. And I also think there's a unique opportunity that the kids are allowed to be involved in excellence. And those that have had that chance and opportunity in your life, you know it makes a big difference. And I think it's a great thing that if young people have that opportunity. All right. so. So the superintendent did uh, address the tradition or the historic sense. Uh, the information that uh, I've received is that, you know, in general, first of all, let me back up a second. This uh, fifth grade is the first opportunity that students have to formally participate in music, whether it be instruments or, or vocal. And uh, traditionally, there has been before school and after school uh, courses as well as sometime during class, during the school day. Um, this has been true for the band orchestra, typically one day, uh, one class per week during school, maybe some exceptions, and then the two, day, two days either before or after school. And choir's traditionally been just one day during the school day. So the changes that uh, we are seeing, and I think the aggregate, aggregate numbers are great, but I think if you look on the individual numbers, it's not always the same story. So, of course, we know that the curriculums have expanded, there are space limitations, all sorts of issues, and so this has forced some of the grade schools to move the music program out of the school and or to move them out of the school day altogether. And you know, when questions have been asked and who has the authority to make these decisions or unmake these decisions or who to talk to, there seems to be a lot of uncertainty as to who does. Uh, the buildings tend to port, point towards administration, the administration tends to point to the buildings. And so it's been difficult to get a clear answer on who, who really is uh, responsible or who can be approached to even address these concerns that, uh, that we have. Um, regardless of who has uh, authority, you know, these changes, has, changes have had negative impact on student participations at certain schools. And we did supply a handout just so you can see the, the data that we're presenting here today. So I just wanted to give two examples. Uh, the first is Seabird Elementary. Uh, and at Seabird they have mu moved the music partially outside the school day. So from my understanding it straddles the end of the day and just after school. Um, however, there's no room at Seabird. And so the kids have to walk to Jefferson in order to receive instruction, which of course they're, they're spending some of the time, class time, just walking over there. The choir data is a little skewed because uh, back in 2011, uh, the students required to be in, in choir, so that's 100% participation, so we won't bother going through those numbers right now. Uh, but as far as band, band and strings, so this is the instruments. In 2011, 56% of the students attending Seaver were in, in, participating in band and, and orchestra. So as of 2014, that number has dropped down to 48%, uh, which represents a 14% reduction. The uh, second example I'd like to give is Adams Elementary. And in this case, the, all of the um, music has, moved, been out, has been moved outside the day. And some classes have been moved so they don't start till after three minutes after school is out, which causes some concerns about fifth graders roaming the halls, so to speak, or having to go and come back, which can be very problematic for some, some families. So you can see the numbers here. Uh, 2011, uh, participation for band and orchestra was 88%. As of 2014, it's 63. And perhaps these numbers are not the same. And if we had the same numbers, that would be great you know, for a conversation we can have in the future. 
the choir, 2011, was like 64 percent, and as of now, 29, or as of last year. Um, so these re represent 28 percent reduction, 51 percent reduction for band and orchestra and choir, respectively. And with that, I will step aside and let Shannon speak. I'm Shannon Kruger, and uh, Adams, Northeast, Midland High. Uh, we've been, uh, we have six children that have come through the school district, and all six have come through the music program. And uh, having been involved in the music program since 1995, when our oldest uh, joined the fifth grade band, I can, I can tell you that I have seen changes, and they haven't been good changes, and there's been many changes over the past couple of years. And within the past couple of years, all the music has been moved out of the day at Adams Elementary, and that has been to a detriment of the students that would like to have that access. Um, the uh, MPS instrumental and vocal music brings students together. All socioeconomic backgrounds are represented. When you look across a classroom, you see everything. All levels of academic talent are represented. You have kids that have unusual needs, exceptional needs, sitting next to kids that are um, on the honor roll plus, IB students. The inclusion of students with unique needs occurs in both instrumental and in vocal music. The safety net for students transitioning from building to building is made real because of being a part of, of either the instrumental or the vocal programs the transition from the elementary building to the middle school building and then more critically the transition from the middle school building to the high school building there is an instant 200 friends in each of the band programs at Dow High and at Midland High that safety net is real and it's with the students and with the parents the various personalities learning to work together sitting side by side it's not always easy we have some competitive kids but yet they learn to work together because they're creating something and, uh, and a lot is, is expected of each of these kids. So moving forward, why we're here. Staffing is not yet set, scheduling is not yet set, and yet as we are asking questions of why things have been moved outside of the school day in buildings that traditionally has not been moved outside of the school day, there is no decision maker presenting him or herself. As we ask the building administrator, we're told district um, talk to somebody down at the district. As we come to the, the district, we're told to talk to the building administrator. We have been asking for two years at one particular elementary school and have received no clear answer. We, we do seek consistency from building to building. Yes, some buildings have been traditionally outside, but that's not fair to a child whose family moves from one elementary to another elementary and that limits their possibility of joining a group if it is held after school and there's not one class during the day. All we are asking is one half hour per week per class to be held during the school day. We already know that music brings benefits to other academic subjects, benefits to overall health, building of character and self-confidence, and it reduces the instances of substance abuse, but these cannot benefit any student who has been limited out of the opportunity to participate in the MPS vocal or instrumental music program. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone wish, else wish to address the board? Those are the only pre-notices we had. <laughs> Hold on to that. <laughs> At least you didn't stick it under the podium. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, my name is Tanisha Frick, and I graduated last year from Midland High School. And I think that it's really important that it was the adults that addressed you guys, but I think it's important to, as a student, address you guys as well about the importance of band and music overall in this city. Uh, I myself started as a fifth grader in band and orchestra, and my band teacher was right there, sitting back there, Mr. Monroe. And I would just like to say how important I think that music is in this district, and I think it's important that we continue to give these children an opportunity to learn. I know that we aren't talking specifically about 
cutting the band programs, but I think that we've all gathered here today to take this opportunity to say that this is an important thing within our district. Um, I continued through elementary school to middle school to high school, and high school was really where I found the importance of music. It was always just something that my mother encouraged me to do, and people all around me in the community. In high school, I really understood the value of music and how it could bring people together, like Shannon was saying, how you really do find the connection within music, and it gives you a lot of opportunities within the school. You can even branch out. I was part of the clarinet choir that was um, made when I was a junior, I think. And it really just opens up a lot of opportunities. Um, there's a lot of scholarships available within the district and outside of the district that give a lot of people opportunities that wouldn't otherwise have that. It builds friendships, and I think that on behalf of everyone here, we just came to say how important it is and how much it matters to us as a community, and I think that it's something that we need to think about a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. My name is Greg Hoffman. I come from Cook, Jefferson, and Bow High. We have two great children, one who is now graduated from the band and one who is currently in the orchestra as a junior. I come in support tonight of the boys. Having our music after school make the boys choose between music or sports. And I challenge you, I don't have the numbers, but I challenge you to break down the numbers over the last 10 years, boys and girls. There was a concert given a couple years ago after the music program was moved to after school. At the high school level, equal boys and girls, maybe even more boys. In the middle school, not very many boys. And in the fifth grade, no boys, maybe one. You're losing the boys with the after school music program. And I challenge you to get that music program back during the day. Thank you. Hey, Mark. Oh, thank you. Mike, Jerry. My name is Mark Turpin. Uh, Woodcrest, Jefferson, Dow. Uh, we have one child, our daughter, who wanted to be here to speak this evening, but she's actually running Amy's auditions for Bring It On. Um, I wanted to speak to two things that were mentioned earlier. The first and foremost is one of Gary's opening comments was about being proactive about the budget at the State House, and he was encouraging you to be proactive. I understand, Mike, what you're saying about this is not on the block, but it is always a tempting thing to put on the block. And when that argument comes up this year, next year because it will come up. We want you to remember all of these people who came and what they had to say. Don't forget this lightly. Uh, the second thing is, I specifically wanted to mention the sense of community and family. It's already been mentioned, but the ready-made family of 200 musicians the kids come into the schools with. In fact, the, uh, the band actually has a parenting system where juniors and seniors specifically befriend freshmen to help make that transition to high school. In the particular case of our daughter, that was crucial. It was critically important. She would not have succeeded in high school, I think, if she had not had that support system. So we urge you 
to look at the feeder system, understand how important it is to the long-term health of the system. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Proactive, and, and I think was a great word because actually it was something that was written on my paper that I didn't say earlier. Um, and I do want everyone to realize that with the budget that we're bringing and the, and the changes and adjustments that we're doing and trying to balance a budget in the 15-16 in the school year is being proactive so we don't have to look at those programs. Yes. And, and right now we have not reduced it programs we have reduced personnel and trying to reduce personnel costs because we know what makes Midland Public School special is its programs and so we are being proactive and also I think uh, even Glare would say we, we, we've been proactive because we reached out to Gary help me a couple weeks ago three weeks ago when the governor announced his budget and say hey can we get you here for a minute to come on in and talk about Midland Public Schools and so Jerry and I have been very proactive. We've been in Lansing multiple Lansing times and spoken probably sometimes at the, not always at the popularity of our local legislators on, on the funding side of this as well. There's multiple pieces into what goes on out there. So, proact is great work. I might just hold my thunder, but yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to address it a little bit later too. Anybody else? I'm Randy Swersman. Our children have gone through the school system through Carpenter, Central, Northeast, and Midland High. Our youngest is now a junior, so we've been involved with the, uh, the um, MPS school system for quite a number of years. I th really think <coughs> that the discussion that we should be having here is how to implement the music program throughout the entire school system at the elementary, um, intermediate, and secondary level as a regular class in the in the uh, time period of the school day. That's really what sh we should be talking about. Um, if you look at our emphasis over the last few years with the IB program, uh, the international program, uh, we're trying to look at international universal education and how our students will fit into the future in that sense. What program is more international and more universal than music? Whether it's math or science, Math or science or social studies can be international in terms of a, in terms of a language. Some some um, some may involve uh, in terms of um, not everybody understanding everything that's going on. But in in terms of music, when you hear music internationally, universally, it's it's there. And so the, the discussion we really should be having here is all the other numbers we're looking at numbers whether they're relevant, the numbers declining in music, and it's obvious why they're declining. It's because of the way we've handled the program. Um, so we, our discussion really should be, how can we implement um, vocal and instrumental music at all levels in middle and public schools, elementary, secondary, intermediate, during the school day, because it should be a regular class. Hmm. I, I, I'm say it. I'm gonna say it. <laughs> um, we normally don't get in dialogue here, but I do want to correct a statement when I hear a misdirected statement. Numbers aren't declining. The numbers have been up in sixth grade. The high school bands are bigger than ever. I don't, I don't see where numbers are necessarily declining. Okay, so I, I just wanted to correct that statement. Honestly, Jerry, I, I think um, something else everyone else needs to realize is we've gone from 70, um, or probably 8,000 students to 7,750 today, and we'll go to 7,200 as you go forward. Keep that in mind. There's logically probably going to be some decline in overall numbers as we decline overall in um, enrollment as well. And, and Mike, I'll add to that. If you think back a decade or plus decade, um, our bands were small. Our high school bands were smaller then, and we had 10,000 kids, and we have 7,000 kids. Dow High is bigger than it's ever been, right, Mike? The Midland is. The Midland High is smaller than okay. it ever is in, in the last 10 years. I'm sorry. I'm Jim Kruger. Um, Adams, Jefferson, Northeast, and Midland. And uh, let me correct your correction a little bit, uh, Mr. Wasserman. Um, what's at issue here, uh, or what the gentleman before me was saying, was is it really at issue here? It is not um, so much the aggregate, but the individual schools that don't have band during the school day. And in those schools, there is no band during the school day. There is decline. 
And so the gentleman did, but he did say it's correct for what he was uh, stating, because what he was talking about was getting the, the band back into the school day. And so his actual statement is correct, because those schools where the band is outside the school day are declining. And that's the real issue. And that's where the school board and the administration needs to step up. When band parents are asking, who do we talk to, you know, for a couple of years, who do we talk to at Adams Elementary to get this resolved? And the administration says, well, you talk to the principal. They talk to the principal. And she's, oh, no, no, no. You've got to talk to the administration. And it's a cycle. It just goes back and forth. There is a miscommunication there. There is a problem there that needs to be resolved. And what would be great, and I think uh, would be a great resolution to it, would be if we just said, yeah, let's get banned into the, into the school day again in our schools. Because everything that's been cited here about all the tremendous benefits that occur to the student because of their participation in band, they're dramatic. When you have a parent that talks about uh, young men, boys, that have to make a choice between athletics or band because it's after school. And you take a look at what are the benefits if they were to choose band, they far outweigh, outweigh what it is for athletics. When you take a look at the, the uh, improved grades, uh, the, lack, the uh, decrease in the drug abuse, the, the, all those different things that are statistics that are right there with the band. Um, so requiring them to make a choice when it's after school just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, my, what I would implore you to do is to take a very serious look at moving band back into the school day in the elementary schools. Uh, we think it will have a dramatic impact on the young men in this, in, in this district. And it will improve a lot of issues that uh, currently cost this district money with uh, some of the underperforming students because they aren't associated with a lot of the benefits that have already been cited by the band parents that have stood up here today. Thank you very much. I wasn't planning to say anything, but um, after let's, uh, my name's Suzanne Real. I have two girls in orchestra and band. Uh, Adams, Northeast Midland, and what I've noticed, what I've heard in all the discussion is, and what's un most unfortunate to me, is that the schools, it, it seems kind of random, and the schools are all making different choices, and all of our children in Midland public schools don't seem to have the same opportunity to be part of this amazing program. And so, what I think the resolution needs to be is, what is the program? It seems really undefined at the fifth grade level. And I think we've heard a lot of, um, a lot of positive support to implement it um, in, in a way that allows every child to have um, equal opportunity. Thanks. Any others? Mark Marin, and currently down to just northeast, but we've had a lot of kids go through Midland also. When I've heard some of the numbers going back and forth about they're up, they're down, I had these terrible flashbacks to you know, last November and the Democrats saying one thing and the Republicans saying another, and I'm not going to comment on, on who was right there. But the good part is, I've been around long enough. I know a lot of people here. I know a lot of people here. I think it's not the Democrats and the Republicans that are trying to put one over on the others. I think everybody here actually wants to do what's best. And uh, I think I've heard you say, what, this week or next week, you're going to get people together and talk about this. Uh, you know, in five minutes with this many people here, we're not going to get to the bottom of whether the numbers are up or whether they're down. But you get a few people in a room that, that work things out and present them to everyone else, and and then I think everyone's going to go away happy. So I, you know, thanks in advance for taking the time to get this right. And 
let everybody figure out what really is going on and, and what will need to happen. So, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Any others? Well, once, one twice. Okay, that said, thanks for coming out, first of all, and appreciate the concerns. Lest, uh, lest I try to be too much of a comedian, you're preaching to the choir a little bit, no pun intended. Um, I'm, and I hate to call it ex-music parent. Uh, Sharon taught my kids sax. Sharon and Doris taught my kids sax. Uh, Steve had them in band for years and years. We were active band parents. I think almost every board member who's had kids through the system has been a band parent. So understand the need and the desire, et cetera. And I think Mike's uh, approach to getting folks together to understand the issue and try to find uh, places where we can solve it, because it's not an insurmountable problem by any means, uh, can be done. The, the other thing, though, I would ask you is that Mike said it well. We have a, throw your favorite number, $3 million looking deficit. And we're out of fund balance. And frankly, we've pulled a lot of rabbits out of our hats through the years, many of which were considered controversial at the time, maybe not so controversial anymore, to solve things that are not core to classrooms and kids and tangential to classrooms and kids. And we've been relatively successful at that. It's getting harder. There's fewer rabbits to pull out of the hat that can do that. We want to avoid programmatic hits. So Mike's got a roster of things that we'll be bringing out budget time in about a month of things we're going to be pursuing next year to get to a balanced budget next year. Uh, almost exclusively non-programmatic. I don't want to say absolutely zero, but there may be some touch on the edges. Again, music not being one of those. Um, so I'd hope we'd gather your support as we go forward to make those changes, because if we don't make those changes, then the next year we will be deficit spending, and we will have no choices but to hit programs, because no one's going to loan us money to run this school district. It's that simple. And uh, so, so solving the problem this year with other things and program things is essential in having people support to understand that if we don't make those the odds of it being non-programmatic the next year are slim and none, and slim probably less town. So anyway, I just wanted to let folks know that as you see things stewing over the next several months, that's what's happening. And, and uh, pay attention, because we'll need your help as we, as we go into some things. Because somebody, some cost somewhere is being reduced uh, when we go through. And someone's not going to be happy with that cost that's being reduced when we go there. But most of it's going to be very quiet. It's going to be efficiencies, et cetera. Um, and, I think that would be my last comment towards that. Any other board members like to comment? I just found myself shaking my head uh, along with you with a lot of the comments that were shared. Um, I don't have a, a, music, a child in music right now, but I'm very supportive of the program and in complete agreement about the benefits that come from this program. And to see all of you come out tonight <coughs> in support of that uh, is great. I mean, it's great for our kids, so thank you. I also want to say thank you all for coming. I really, I like to see a packed house, and I just really appreciate hearing all the comments that you shared with us tonight. I agree with you too. I mean, music is so beneficial to kids. You know, uh, besides just the enjoyment they get from it, and someone talked about the friendships and the, all those things. It also teaches uh, students self-discipline, having something that you need to work at every day, along with your academic studies. It's going to be very good for kids. That's one of the reasons that I got my kids started in music originally was I, I thought it would be really good for them and that they would enjoy it a great deal. So I understand how you feel and I thank you for coming. Okay, thank you. Thank Mike. you, everyone. We have a full agenda, so we're going to move on, guys, because we might be here at about 11 o'clock. We keep going here. <laughs> so, uh, Look at them leave. We say 11 If you do want to <laughs> leave, might, right now might be the time to do it. Go ahead and I'll hold a minute. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. She was a very good friend of my daughter's in high school. Okay. Yeah. And you're I'm Yvonne Gordon. My daughter's Libby Gordon. Okay, yeah, Libby. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. 
Well, we're going to do our, um, our Shining Star Employees of the Month, and our first one is Ramona Reed Jones, if she'd like to come up. Let me read a little bit about Ramona. <laughs> She's getting nervous in front right of a lot now. Of people. Huh? <laughs> yes. Miss Reed um, Jones began her MPS career in 1979 as geography teacher and volleyball coach at Northeast Intermediate School. Ramona earned a bachelor's degree from Bennett College in Greensboro, North Carolina, in 1979 with a major in history and a minor in education and English. Miss Reed Jones' entire 36-year teaching career has been at Northeast Intermediate intermediate middle school working with middle school age students. In 1988 Ramona was a Gerstacker Teacher Award recipient. Today Miss Reed Jones teaches Eastern Hemisphere to Northeast seventh grade students. This award comes at a pivotal time in Ramona's career. On April 1st she leaves us to begin her well-deserved retirement. <laughs> One of Ramona's <laughs> former supervisors stated Miss Jones is a dedicated professional who clearly demonstrates a commitment to student learning. Her commitment to quality instruction is very evident. Yet another supervisor stated, Ms. Jones is respected by her peers. Ms. Jones is a leader among the staff and people respect her ideas and opinion. She is a favorite among students and parents. One of her strengths is her high expectations for students and her firm understanding of how middle school students think and learn. Ramona was nominated for the Shining Star Award by the MPS parent. Some of her comments include, there are many teachers who teach but not many teachers who go behind the call of duty to guide our children above lessons like time management, balancing schedules, and encouraging them to not only learn, but guide them on the path to success into the future. She recognizes that our children have many after-school activities. She pre-plans her lesson plans each week, giving the students opportunities to read and work ahead on weekends to prepare for the upcoming week by handing out materials each Friday. Social studies is a very detailed class, and this preparation work I have found makes it much easier for my daughter to stay focused on upcoming material and take some stress off, stress off her already heavy homework schedule. I have heard from our daughter that Miss Jones has a great personality, is funny, upbeat, and brings <laughs> lots of laughter to her classroom, which makes it for a great for a lear great learning environment. Best wishes to Mrs. Jones, and thank you, Ramona. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Am I? Oh, God. <laughs> Two ex students up here, I think Ouch. I heard. So. I'm not that old, <laughs> <laughs> Our next shiny star is Blake Sobel. Mr. Sobel began his MPS career as Director of Te Technology in April of 2012. Blake earned his Bachelor's of Science degree from Saginaw Valley State University in 2001 with a major in Computer Information Systems and a minor in General Business. Before coming to Midland Public Schools, Blake worked for ESC Region 20 in San Antonio, Texas as the Component Director of T TXEIS Programming <laughs> Services. You can call Texas. Uh, okay. <laughs> in Blake's relatively short three-year tenure with us, he has done an amazing job as he oversees and directs all, all aspects of the technology for our district. Many things stand out about Blake in his very complex and ever-changing role, such as his leadership, communication, professionalism, and vision. But I believe one of the most impre impressive is his sense of customer service and how he has fostered its importance in his team. When it comes to district technology, we have many, many customers, students, staff, parents, community members, other educational districts and entities, and many more. Blake and his team handle and troubleshoot technology questions, problems, issues, and concerns effort effortlessly, timely and courteously each and every day. Blake was nominated for the Shining Star Award by MPS Parents. Here are just a few of their comments. Earlier this year, I was having trouble downloading the MS Office software at home, and Blake walked <laughs> me through this successfully. Last night, I contacted Blake for help with an iPad issue, a second grader induced. He was able to solve the problem quickly, which made for an iPad, uh, which made for a very happy second grader. In both instances, Blake was extremely responsive and never hesitated to help me outside his normal work hours. Another parent comment, I was having issues being able to log into the webmail on my home computer. I contacted the district using the talk to his form. Blake contacted me, and I was not able to respond 
till 10 p.m. But Blake still responded to me at that late hour. The next day we did a remote session so he could see the issue I was having. He spent about 30 minutes with me. We were able to determine the what was happening. I'm very pleased that MPS has a technology department and that you have an employee like Blake who's committed to providing excellent customer service. He really, really knows his staff such that he was able to trust you, troubleshoot very effectively to find the problem. Thank you, Black. You can expect a massive increase yeah. of phone calls. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Good evening. Good evening. It's good to see you all. And uh, I'm going to get a chance to introduce to you some very wonderful people from Carpenter Street School, which I have been blessed to be working with since November of this year. At Carpenter Street School, our focus, like in all of our schools, is academic success. We also realize that academic barriers are not the only barriers to student success. In order to break through all of these barriers, the staff has implemented, implemented After School Scholars Program, led by Mrs. Jacques, who ironically is also our music teacher, <laughs> and several community and private individual mentor programs that meet over lunch or after school. To give you some more details on these, I'd like to introduce to you Carpenter's Family Intervention Specialist, Francisca Himmer. Thank you, Mr. Lauer. So at the school, we have several partners that participate in our mentoring program. Some mentoring takes place during the school day, during the student's lunch hour, and this is their favorite time. It's the parents' favorite time to have mentoring available. And some takes place after school. Uh, some of our partners include students at S SVSU, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters program, which does a lunchbox learners to encourage students who are having trouble with readings, mostly second graders during the school day during lunch, and also an after school program where they have mentors who are young adults, some high school students, some college students. We have a Crusaders for Kids, which is a church group that comes in after school to help students with homework and also encourage them to stay active. They usually do some homework and then maybe some floor hockey or soccer when it gets nice outside. And we also have some wonderful individual community members who choose to volunteer during their lunch hour, taking time from work to mentor students. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to a couple of parents, mentors, and student groups that we have that would like to share their experience with you. Uh, first, I will have Michael Ledesma, who is a fourth grade student, and his mentor is Alan Vance, who was with our SVSU team, and his mother is Stephanie Selno, and they'll show, just share some of their experience with you. Well, I don't know what to say, but, um, <laughs> well, me and Alan and my mom are very close, um, friends and Alan uh oh, I don't know it. well <laughs> Alan and me uh usually will sometimes do homework and we sometimes play chess too um and then I might go outside or I just stay in with him that too but um <laughs> <laughs> well um my favorite part with Alan would be like when he gave me that well the rattlesnake rattle that he gave me um, <laughs> <so weird. laughs> I liked it um and when I don't know when we played chess together um and he's yeah <laughs> and uh uh I don't know what to say now. Um, Very good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And I'll have Michael's 
mom just tell us uh, what has been her experience having her son be involved in the mentoring program? I'm Stephanie Zelno and Michael's mother, and um, he really has benefited a lot from this. Um, he doesn't have his father in the picture, and Alan's really helped out a lot with the self-confidence and things like that. It's just a good program to have for the kids. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Alan Vance, and I'm a student at SVSU. Uh, I'm a part-time substitute teacher in the Midland School District. And one of the classes that I took, a uh, child development class, uh, part of the requirement was to uh, volunteer. And I was assigned over at Carpenter. Uh, that was supposed to end at the uh, semester that ended at Christmas time. But I enjoyed it so much that mm -hmm. you know, I'm planning on doing it for a long time now. <clears throat> My expectation was that I was going to be uh, paired up with a problem child. Uh, what I found out, though, is Michael was very smart, succeeding, doing well in class. Uh, he's an awesome soccer player, <laughs> a fine chess player. And it's just been nice to grow this relationship, and I hope it continues on for many more years. And next we have Noah Hintz, his mom, Jennifer Avery. Excuse me, and his mentor, John Napoli, who is one of our individual community members who have chosen to mentor, and we'll just have him. Do you want to start, John? Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I started um, uh, meeting with Noah on Wednesdays about a year ago. Uh, it's been a great experience. Um, you know, I was lucky growing up to have a lot of positive influence in my life but outside of teachers and, and my parents. Um, you know, whether it be coaches or you know some friends friends parents have made a positive impact in my life so when I was presented with the opportunity to to you know, kind of pay that forward uh, I was really excited and it succeeded all of my expectations Noah has been a good buddy of mine for the last year we you know I've enjoyed watching him watching you know grow physically he's gotten really big last year <laughs> um, but you know he's gotten great at crossword puzzles his jump shots really improved. <laughs> Play basketball occasionally, um, and I'm just really happy to be a part of the program and have the opportunity. I would encourage anybody who would like to, you know, volunteer their time. It's more than worth it. Um, so if you know somebody or you yourself would like to do it, uh, it's it's really really a great thing to do. Thanks. Noah, can you join us? Come on up, Noah. <clears throat> Um, what kind of things have you done? Um, we got to play bit basketball and we get to talk to each other. And when it's cold out, I don't have to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> That we got to eat pizza. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's grown. All right. yeah. <laughs> now we'll just hear from Noah's mom. It's Jennifer Avery. Hi, my name is Jennifer. Um, this program has been so positive for my son. His dad works out of state, so he struggles with that a lot. And he every week he's so excited for the lunchtime he gets with John. I hear about it, and the pizza he was speaking of was um, for his birthday. He just had a birthday. So it's just it's a great program, and his face just lights up when he talks about it and all the things they get to do together. So it's been really good for us. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is my first year at Carpenter. Um, I showed up, and the program was already happening, apparently. And my job was just to keep it going. So it's been great. It's been really positive. The kids love it when it's their day for mentoring. They are there in the front office before the bell even rings. And if a mentor doesn't show up, then it's a meltdown. <laughs> so it's been wonderful. And we are actually working to grow the program. At the end of the month, we have a reading 
March's Reading Month event with United Way, and we're hoping to bring on some more mentors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob, I think in the near future, I'm going to put in a requisition for a bunch of microphones. If it keeps them this quiet, I'm going to put them in the <laughs> 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 when you see these kids working with their mentors, I can't tell which face shows the most joy, whether it's the student or the mentor. And just in closing, I'd like to mention to everyone out there, uh, first of all, how grateful we are for the great mentors we have to complement the fantastic staff we have at Carpenter, but also to encourage everyone out there that has a, a, just a little extra time to invest that in a kid. There's no greater investment you can make than the time you spent with a child. And uh, certainly you can call me a carpenter. <clears throat> We're glad to sign you up. Thank you for letting us speak tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you guys. We, and now we have um, some amazing students are going to show you some work that they've done on our logo that I think most of you are aware of that we've been working through. The commercial art class at Dow High. Are you going to speak, Carol? I am. You, you can start it off. It's all yours. It's the arts night tonight, I suppose, and I um, appreciate the opportunity to address you about this very needed redesign over the years. Um, one of the things that I would like to do is explain a little bit about where this former image that has always been our image, as long as I've had a tenure in the Midland Public Schools, where it originated from, and then take you into some potential prototypes for things for you to consider. We just passed a very successful bond millage. Um, we have great art program, we have great music programs, and we really need to enlist the help of our kids for our schools. And so the great Cindy Young approached me. <laughs> That's no understatement, by the way. <laughs> I, one of my all-time favorite people in Midland Public Schools, a giant, um, came, to, came to us at Dow High and um, suggested that we it wondered if we'd be interested in taking our hand at this. We don't know if we can resolve it, but we sure gave it a shot. Um, let me take a little thing here and uh, advance it. All right, Cindy, why is this thing not advanced? Because it's upside down. There we go. <laughs> okay, um, Blake? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll you tonight at 10 to figure out how to Okay, anyways, this is our current logo. We all know that. Um, I, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to let you know that I did not draw this thing. <laughs> our former and uh, one of our past coordinators, second coordinator of art for Midland Public Schools penned it. His name was Jim Hoppensberger. Um, it spun off the M for Midland, and I think it also represented an envelope, the com communication technology of the 50s and 60s. Te technology of the 2Ks had, has really made this image even more obsolete than when I started. Um, Dr. Gary Hughes in 2000 called me in with the late Jim Brooks, former assistant principal of Jefferson Middle School, who at the time handled publicity for MPS, and asked me to add the byline, experience the excellence. And that was it. Um, a lot of people that I'm affiliated with in Midland Public Schools think that that, has a, that slogan has a little bit of an elitist undertone. Um, Mrs. Young, as I mentioned before, Mr. Sherrill, contacted me knowing that we have a mini design team in our commercial art with printing technology class at Dow High School, where students train to become very successful designers and work on projects exactly like this one for members from the community at large. It made a lot of sense to all of us um, to have our students develop and establish a new image on behalf of their district. The challenge for a commercial art class was that our leadership really didn't know um, what they wanted in a new image. They were eager to work with us to understand the scope of the project as well as to get closer to what they thought would make a good design. They enlisted our commercial arts students' help in taking them through that process. The beauty of taking it to our students in, com art, in the com art class is that our students would generate 25 to 30 different images and thoughts, giving Mr. Sherrill and Mrs. Young multiple ideas in which to consider. A design company, due to needing um, to pay for services rendered, uh, only generates a few ideas for payment. If you don't really know what you want, this can get expensive and frustrating in a hurry. Our students, as, as any new designers will do, 
work pro bono, <laughs> meaning that they get a real live audience <laughs> to practice their newly acquired skills on our clients, and their client doesn't have to pay and gets a lot of ideas for free. <laughs> um, in the 2013 school year, Mr. Sherrill and Mrs. Young joined forces with our commercial arts students to begin the process of working through, the, through options and possibilities. What developed out of that partnership was direction, as well as some good ideas, but mostly a host of good slogans were developed, which helped to guide the actual appearance of the logo. For the remainder of that school year, Mr. Sherrill and Mrs. Young percolated on some of the images and thoughts and decided to return to H.H. Dow High School in 2014-15 and work with the new set of commercial arts students and second year students to see if they could actually resolve and finalize our new image. In considering a new image for MPS, the business of education is very complex and diverse. Education is a multi-staffed and a diversely targeted organization whose main product is intrinsic. Hundreds of people contribute to various children's development and education over the course of a dozen years to create a high school graduate. The services provided by both the parent organization, Midland Public Schools, and each of its subsidiaries, Chestnut Hill, Siebert, Adams, Carpenter, East Lawn, Woodcrest, Plymouth, Jefferson and Northeast, as well as culminating at Midland High or H.H. Dow High School are vast. Also considerations of what the parent logo should look like aesthetically was also a challenge. Should it be a completely new image or a massage of our former image? What color should it be so as not to steal or drown out the existing look used by all of our subsidiary schools? And of course, should this image be rooted in tradition or focus solely on the location of our dis school district in Michigan or on our product staff or our students? Should it be futuristically contemporary, look traditional like the bedrock of any community, or should it create comfort cycling back in a modern twist using a retro image? How do we take such a complex organization and align it to a new image and then market it? How will it work digitally on printed materials as well as on video? A logo needs to be the size of a dime on a business card and adaptable to an enormous sized image on the side of a truck or on a billboard located on the side of a road. We need a logo to say a great deal with very little. And how do you establish the parent image without overshadowing the greatness of the subsidiaries that they govern? what the, the colors that they use and have used for years and the mascots that they also use. And how do you continue to market a new image without changing the current MPS brand reputation for excellence? Obviously designing a new school district logo is a very complex design problem to solve. So we turned it over to our graphic design students. They heard Mr. Sherrill's presentation and went into intensive research looking at all sorts of educational images, non-educational images, and doing research on complex business images like our own hometown Dow Chemical Company, who is also a complex business responsible for many, many products and services that they provide the world community, just like our school district does. A great deal of sketching and resketching, rethinking, retooling, and investigations took place before digitalizing each student's images. We then called back Mr. Sherrill and Mrs. Young and other officials from MPS to hear some presentations from our commercial arts students, which shared our students' thoughts and ideas on what they felt ought to be our new image. Each student focused on a main important idea and concept in which to frame their image design around. Five finalists were selected, and then these five students investigated some suggestions, color changes, and mild design tweaks with their concepts. Each student was asked to choose a slogan that they felt best worked with their design, but be open to the possibility of a switch by our school, by our board of education. We know that the final decision of which slogan would be left to our school board. However, each design student needed to secure the best location for a slogan in their design. The five designs, as you know, were posted to the district website to allow for voting as well as for suggestions. Each design will generally stay very close to the images we share with you tonight. However, type fonts may be tweaked and minor modifications may occur. Um, colors for our images are again up to our school board, but we help hope to be able to guide you in that process. Once the final design is established, I highly suggest we write an MPS graphical standard document so that we may govern the intellectual property of our new logo image. Our, our usage and others of our new 
image needs to stay consistent and under our control. Things like proximity, color, typographics used, and how it is to be used black and white, and how it is to be used in conjunction with other logos, like perhaps even our other schools in our district, would be a good idea to develop, and we'd be happy to do that for you. That way, you can use and enforce so that we do not confuse our brand and logo in future marketing. Are there any questions about any of that? <laughs> okay. If there are not, I'd like to turn this over to the five students whose designs are very much in the running to become our new logo. They will share with you the concepts that drove the look of their images. Hope Harnaway, come on up. Wow. Hello. As you can tell, my name is Hope Harnoise, and I'm a senior at Dow. And this is my design for the Midland Public Schools logo. Um, when I think about Midland Public Schools, I think about like teacher and student relationships, the nurturing and growth aspect. And the first thing that came to my mind with that is like a bird's nest, just like that care aspect and that like nurturing environment. So that is what I basically was inspired by. So the bottom is meant to represent like an abstract bird's nest. And I have all the lines going like different directions, different ways and sizes just to represent like different students going different directions. But like on the corner, it all comes together to like branch off and we all like leave in an upward direction. Um, the font that I chose, I chose it because it's like bold and it just makes a statement. It says like we're at the public schools. And I chose the inspiring excellence because I really do think it is about like teachers inspiring and other students inspiring each other to do excellent things. And the way that the inspiring excellence is placed, it kind of highlights the and. So it's like we're both in public schools and we inspire excellence. And I chose the color gray because I think it adds like a nice dimension. But I'm also open to other slogans and colors. So yeah, thank you. Great job. I'd like to call up Miss Jenna Query. Um, I'm Jenna Query and I'm also a senior and I just want to thank you guys for considering my design and it's an honor to be chosen as a finalist. And um, the initial project launch, um, we were going through our design phase and coming up with ideas. Um, Mrs. Lewin challenged us to think about what we genuinely loved about MPS and one thing that I really like is I actually enjoy learning and finding out new things. And um, I'm a really curious person and I want to find something that everyone could apply their curiosity to and something that incites fascination in everyone is fire from like the beginning of time. People use it to stay alive till now when we actually understand how it works and use it in industry and um, throughout our lives. And uh, I feel that everyone can apply it to their experience through MPS. And um, another thing that I wanted to note on with my design is the swoop that kind of encompasses it because another Along with my tagline that I used, which is igniting excellence, another one we had was talking about our world-class um, view and how we don't want to just stay focused on our area of the planet, but um, apply to everywhere else. And it kind of just symbolizes the globe and how our schools, um, at least through my experience, are very, um, sorry, <laughs> they uh, go with other parts of the world and like through our IB programs and our languages. And I feel like MPS touches on that and they put that in the forefront. And I wanted to include that in my logo. And then I just used a bold type font and I had it kind of scooched into the ellipse because it brings it all together. And I used the tagline, igniting excellence, because I feel that our teachers do promote excellence and igniting went very well with my um, use of fire. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lauren, can you scooch up here? <laughs> I like that word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I based my design off of the Midland Center for the Arts. And when making this design, um, I thought that there was like many components of uh, what represent or what like Midland stands for. And I thought that it would be too hard to encompass um, everything into that design and I didn't want to make it too narrow and just focus on one thing so I decided to make my design um, abstract and minimal and so uh, the circle represents like the togetherness and how um, 
how our staff and our students work together to make this amazing program that we have right now for Midland Public Schools. And the star represents the students and the staff and just the district overall and how like we can go in different directions. And the gold in it is actually um, representing high achievement and education. And what's cool about the gold is that it's made out of different yellows and it's not metallic. So um, what's good about that is it'll be nice for printing <coughs> and um, if you change it to a grayscale, it'll still look nice rather than um, if it was metallic. And so for all these reasons, uh, this is why this MPS um, logo would best represent in the public school. Thank you. Okay, Brandy Wheeler. Uh, yes, hello, I'm Brandy Wheeler, and I thank you, uh, I'd like to thank you for your consideration as well. Um, what my logo is, is I did it, decided to do a uh, redesign of the old logo, so I took the uh, green triangle for the <coughs> email, I guess, or the M. I took the green triangle and I put it in sort of a moving forward position and then uh, overlaid or underlaid a uh, different triangle underneath it to add a drop shadow effect to it. And then what I added uh, as well for the color triangles, they are the same shape as the old green triangle, a sort of like a homage, I guess, to the old and then moving into the new. And I tried to add uh, the colors of, like a lot of colors to not exclude anything from the schools because the schools all have their own colors. And if you add them all to the logo, they can all see themselves somewhere in the logo. And then what I did is I just added uh, the simple Midland Public Schools on the side and then the inspiring innovation and uh, any of this is up to uh, change, I guess, uh, for the colors or the tagline or anything like that. So I just made it as a new aspect to the old. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And then last but not least, Sarah Shoemaker. So first of all, what I wanted to bring to you guys' attention was that the logo that we choose is going to be um, viewed by not only our district and its affiliates, but the districts around us, and it will convey their opinion of our school district. And I thought that was really important that we recognize that and um, recognized it as a very important part of our decision. So uh, when Mr. Sherrill came to Dow for the first time, he introduced the idea of incorporating the Tridge to the logo. And I tried to kind of run with that for a little while. And I in, uh, did a little bit of investigation on what a bridge might mean in a logo. And what I came up with were some things such as unity, um, which is shown through our school with our t-shirts student bonds. Um, it's also very iconic of our uh, school system. It's not anything else that our schools, any other school system will um, see because it's just so unique to us. Um, and it also represents a support system. Um, and this is shown through um, the educators and the staff um, with our students, and that just shows how much we, they are supporting us as, lo as well as the rest of you and um, the ones that we don't maybe see as much but are still always there supporting our students. Um, it also represents a journey, and it's a moving forward motion um, of how our school system has been always pushing our students to be um, headed in the right direction that they've been aspiring to be at. Um, Mrs. Lewin, for example, has really pushed me to follow my journey. And um, it's really helping me to become a very uh, devoted student. So the slogan that I chose is Community of Ingenuity. And it's symbolizing the uh, great minds that we've seen go through our system. 
and um, they can range from Herbert Henry Dow to Alden B. Dow, um, both majoring in very different aspects, but both coming out as very, very well um, represented. Um, also, um, the elegance of the font, I think, represents the uh, high standards that our uh, school system represents. And um, I moved here from my freshman year, and I could honestly tell right away that this education system was very highly um, commended for their achievement. So that's what I thought was most important to bring to your attention about my logo. And I thank you so much for this opportunity. It was really a great chance for me to learn about myself. So thank you. I don't know if you have any questions for any of them. Or can we raise the, <laughs> yeah, can the screen? I can. <laughs> so we can see what we're yeah. talking to. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. I wanted to Thank ask, you, Lauren, you didn't talk about your tagline. I was just wondering where, what, where you got that or why that was important, why you chose that, I guess. That was just the one part you didn't talk about. Oh, yeah. Well, why I chose it was I think that it best represents us, and I just think that it sounds the best out of all okay. of the um, taglines that you gave us. That was the one that I thought <clears throat> sounded the best, and that was why I decided to use it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sarah, uh, why, why did you pick the tones of red for the M? For the M, I chose the tones of red because, um, first of all, uh, it symbolizes a lot of, it, it just stands out very well. Uh, that kind of goes along with the iconic symbol of the Tridge. Um, it kind of shows how we just uh, ex expect a lot from our students and um, we stand out from the rest of the school systems. I just want to comment. I think the five of you are brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so thank you. Um, the amount of time and the research and, and all of the background work that you clearly put into this is very evident in the final product. Um, I like all of them for different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, I can tell you it's going to be a tough decision um, to pick a winner. So thank you very much for presenting them to us tonight. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? They were all great. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I, I'm blown away. Mm -hmm. um, truly am. I, it far exceeded my expectations. <coughs> when you hear the thinking far behind it, it's yes. amazing. Yes. Right, yeah. that's yeah. the really thing. Is. It's yes. the thinking of why you put each thing yeah. in. That's in the professionalism way of out work. of my realm of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the professionalism of your work is, is really good. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's very good. Really good. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that uh, Cindy promises me that by the next board meeting we're going to have some kind of decision. Oh. Mm. <laughs> okay. So good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. One of the harder ones we make. <laughs> Thank you. And we have one more, yep. as I told you, busy agenda, and, and this one's probably equally as important. Uh, Chris Shaven's going to talk a little bit about um, where we are potentially heading with our uh, media instruction and blend it and online learning. Um, we've made some uh, steps forward, and uh, we want to keep you up to breast what we're, we're doing. So all yours, Chris. Hopefully I didn't step out of line there. No, you didn't. <coughs> Excuse me. I was actually going to say on... Um, we may want to talk about agenda time and that. Those are tough facts to follow. Holy <laughs> <laughs> um, smokes. But what a, wonderful, uh, what a wonderful opportunity to follow all of that. I bring to you a conversation tonight about remodeling as well. Um, and we've heard a lot of that. A lot of, about looking at the way we do things, looking at how we can improve on them, um, and I just am amazed by you know, Mr. Lauer bringing in his, his folks and, and our art students and of course the Shining Star Awards that, that we have out there too, just amazing things are going on. Our e-learning department is now six years old. There's been a lot of things that have changed from our initial, uh, I guess, our offerings in that e-learning department. There's uh, many new things that the state allows us to do. 
our clientele is beginning to ask for different kinds of options, and we'd like to provide those options. Um, we need to also make what we do more efficient for all of our employees, but and also more available and accessible to our students. Um, so I bring to you tonight some ideas for uh, remodeling our e-learning program. But I want to start off with a little bit of, of history, where we started and where we've been. This whole uh, department came into play when we identified a need for credit recovery. We eventually brought in E2020, and E2020 has rebranded, speaking of rebranding, they call themselves Edgenuity now, uh, but that was used primarily for credit recovery. Then we also found a way to use that for credit protection, identifying those students who are failing at marking period, giving them an opportunity to revisit uh, content that they didn't do so well in, to bring their grade up from a failing grade to a passing grade. And that's really been a tool that teachers have been able to use. We've also been able to offer seat time waivers. Seat time waivers, in a nutshell, is an opportunity for our students to still be a Midland Public Schools student, but, also, but take their uh, classes off-site through online providers. We have some students who are half and half, say taking three classes online and three classes in our face-to-face, -face, and then the combinations go up. Seat time waivers kick in when we're talking about three or more online classes. But we also, as, as scheduling needs have changed, we've identified a need to provide some options that we don't offer. For example, AP Stats has been one that Midland High has uh, used online learning for for quite some time. Uh, but we have other classes that have fit into that definition as well. Some AP Computer Science courses, American Sign Language, we don't offer that. We've had quite an interest in that. Japanese, Chinese, and so on. Um, I'm going to speak to this in a, little, uh, in a little bit, but there's also a law out there that says students have some choice in what they would like to take through online learning. Uh, they can take up to two classes, and I'll mention that shortly. That's our history, but I want to throw an important disclaimer out there. Very important. Capital letters. This has never been about taking kids out of our classrooms. What's really important to know, it's about giving kids those opportunities to reach their, their goals, their uh, education development plans. We have worked really hard to get our students into our classrooms first, and I know the counselors do their best to ensure that they're getting into our classrooms. <clears throat> but when we have singletons, um, you know, we hear a lot about music tonight. Band is one of those singletons. We've got lots of kids involved in that at the high school level. And it's, sometimes it's hard to schedule that, so we fall back on e-learning. Um, but it's all about the students and their opportunities. Excuse me. So that's the history. That's my disclaimer. It's important also to note, though, that our clientele is coming to us asking for other options because those options are bringing themselves out in other places. So for lack of any better term, competition, if you will. They can find these options elsewhere. Uh, K-12, for example, if you go to this website, you plug in a zip code, you can find an institution that would provide the options. Michigan Connections Academy is another one, providing options. So if we don't begin into this route, we could potentially be losing students. I mentioned earlier the law that allows students to take up to two courses uh, online. That is the 21F section of the State School Aid Act. And what that does is that gives students an opportunity to go to the statewide catalog and look to see what's available and offered. Now, I'm very proud to say, as Midland Public Schools, we have already been, as I mentioned in the history, we've already been offering these solutions to our students um, it, to try and help with schedule conflicts, to help meet those goals that, that they are trying to achieve. Um, but this is out there uh, for students to peruse. And if they come into a, a counselor and say they're interested in one of these classes, then per the law, we need to pursue it and look into it further for them. <coughs> Remodeling, that idea of how we do things differently. I found some trends uh, out there in society. 50% uh, of all high school classes in the US will be taught online before the end of this decade. And I actually found that probably about a year ago, so who knows where, where that statistic is, is going. I know for sure 40 states have virtual schools or state-led online initiatives, Michigan being one of them. And then there'll be 1.8 million course enrollments in K-12 online courses 
And that statistic was from 2009, 2010. So that's an antiquated statistic, and I'm sure that's, that's gone up. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. So in this remodeling, how did we dive in? We dove in feet first. And uh, last year, I wrote a staff development proposal to look at getting involved, getting our teachers involved in blended and online learning. One of the points I'm going to make uh, shortly is that with the classes that we have been able to offer our students, our teachers are not facilitating those courses. That's another teacher somewhere else, Michigan certified, but not a Midland Public Schools teacher. So we wanted to figure out ways to get our teachers involved. So I wrote a staff development proposal that was, that was approved for a group of teachers to look into designing uh, online classes for us to offer for our students. And so we have six teachers from both high schools. Uh, they're working currently on biology, psychology, marketing, accounting, computer science, and statistics. I originally got this group together uh, over the summer. And we started with actually everything I've just shared with you right now. The history, what's out there, what's available, how the state's made some changes, and so on. So they understood um, everything that was happening out there in our field. And then I brought them back again a few weeks later, gave them an opportunity to digest that, gave them uh, some professional development on the beginnings of what it takes to make a good class. We looked, I handed them uh, an online learning uh, best practices book for them to start looking at and so on. And so they started working. I then brought them back in November and during the professional development day, we created this list of positives. The teachers who were creating these courses began to implement them with, um, small, in small chunks with their students. And I have blended and online, and I should back up a, a brief moment and also men mention what the difference between blended and online. Online learning is 100% separation of time and space of student and teacher. Blended, however, is, the def is, is a, quite an umbrella definition, but in the um, most immediate definition is something we already have going on in our schools, just integrating technology, using modern tools. But on the far other side of that spectrum, blended learning could look uh, like students only meeting with the teacher two days a week or three days a week or something like that, maybe in office hours. But there is a face-to-face -face component in the blended learning environment. So going back to this slide, the teachers built some things and they wanted to try them out with some of their students. And this is what came out of that first try with those courses or those small modules that they began to build. Um, they found out that it's important uh, right up front to teach students how to be good online learners. So they began to have discussions with their, with their students. Got a lot of good feedback from parents. They thought it was a great first step into transition into college. Colleges are offering this style of learning, so why not start them early? A lot of comments about fostering student independence. Also, you know, we've heard a lot too about snow days. Well, if you have your content in this <clears> case, <throat> snow days become instructional days as well, and students can spend some time continuing, and there's no lack of, lack of instructional time, if you will. Um, and then the last bullet, give students the opportunity to take the course when the rest of their schedule was full. Uh, actually, Mr. Bob Fox over at Midland High was able to get enough content. He already had enough content in a Moodle course. They were able to do some creative scheduling for two students. And so they reported in a different hour since he had space in his classroom and he was able to meet with them when needed. But they just took off while he was working with the rest of his class. So it offers quite a bit of options. They also came, this group of teachers also came with a set of challenges. Boy, they had to figure out how to grade in this environment. But assessments were a whole lot different. <coughs> Also making sure students stay on track and learning new ways to know what students need. One of the teachers made the comment, he said, when those kids walk in the door, I know that there's either a problem or things are going great. I can just see a look on their faces. This is a little bit different, even in the blended environment. You know, I need to, to get some new tools in my toolbox. And I told them, it's just a matter of time. We'll learn how to do this. We just need the experience to, to, um, to, to lean on. But the yellow bullet that is, is really the most important, and it was that content creation. In this staff development proposal, I allotted 40 hours, and I laugh, because that was eaten up in a heartbeat. 
really what we've found through our research is that it really is going to take 250 to 300 clock hours to really create an internet savvy course. An internet savvy meaning a course that is easy, and I don't use the word easy, manageable for students to navigate, also manageable for the instructor to keep up to date, uh, make sure links are active, make sure videos are accurate, and, and so on. So that, that 40 hours was, um, was eaten up pretty quickly. So after that meeting, um, they set back to work and we all kept working on our individual components. So looking at what was next, um, the Virtual Academy, you saw Mr. Lauer up here, very proud of his position over at Carpenter Street Elementary School with some of the reorganization, some of the online work that he was doing was uh, passed over to me. And so I began working on some of the things that he was doing with Virtual Academy. And I decided to link the two projects together and figure out, okay, what's the key to get our teachers teaching these classes? Because we already have a subgroup of teachers doing that. But we've got to figure out some way to make that more manageable. Because we can't expect our folks to spend 250, 300 hours just creating the course. We'll be, it'll be years before we even get in the game. So I went out uh, and researched a bunch of entities. And I asked two questions. What's your structure? And who is your content provider? So basically, how are you running your program? But where are you getting your content? So these 17 entities, I either made a phone call or visited um, or saw at other conferences and meetings that I went to. Um, you can see Clintondale Virtual School, St. Clair County, and, and so on. Um, many of these, some of these are actual school systems. Some of these are content providers. Um, some of these are actually RESD or ISD supported. So I was looking at the whole range. And the conclusions that I came up with is, first of all, first yellow bullet, a lot of these districts are relying on third-party content providers. And honestly, I heard at the Michigan Virtual University Symposium that I attended, of the 18,000 titles that are in that catalog, 97% are third-party contractors out there. There are some districts who are creating their content from the ground up, and they're super proud of it. And I'm super <clears throat> proud of them for it, but they're looking at maybe six classes so far, as opposed to you know, six classes do the percentage of that in those 18,000 titles. You just don't have a presence, or, or how do you move forward quickly in this avenue with what our clientele is asking us for? Um, so so it, was an interesting, it was an interesting research project. So bringing all that together for this project, uh, we, need to, we need to find a way, a springboard, to help our teachers be successful in this arena. Um, we needed to find a content source, and we needed to, to look at a few courses that our teachers teach. And we also need to, to decrease the courses that we purchase. And like I mentioned, really decrease the courses, courses that we purchase simply because somebody else is teaching our kids. So we began the search for where do we get our content. And um, with that search, I came up with two entities. And really, the, 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 the question, uh, the driving question in this search was, OK, you're going to provide the content, but can we put our MPS stamp of approval on it? We all know we have various point levels. We have AP, we have IB. We needed to be able to massage that content to make it uh, effectively our own class so that our kids, when they walk in and they're taking this class, they know it aligns with AP psychology or they know it aligns with algebra or pick your favorite class that we know the alignment is there. Um, we currently subscribe to Edgenuity, like I already mentioned, for credit recovery. They have some tools that are coming, but it's too late. They're not going to be in place until this fall and we needed to hit the ground running on this project. So I was then put in contact with, at the time, superintendent of Croswell Lexington Schools, Dr. Kevin Miller. And he shared with me their program, Blue Water Virtual, and their content provider. And their content provider is abbreviated JST, and that stands for Job Skills and Technology. And this entity uh, brings to us content that is already uh, it's available now. It's aligned to the Common Core <clears throat> standards, to the MME. It's MDE approved. Um, a piece that I need to mention that I highlighted in yellow, that state catalog, all of those courses that go into that state catalog must be 
reviewed, professionally reviewed by a third party. That's a whole other rigmarole that, although it's, it's very necessary, it's very important, and we see the uh, review statistics in the catalog, it's something else that we have to pull a group together, go through that review process, and even the recommendations for that review process is don't have your own people do it. Have a third party do it. Well, this content comes to us already reviewed, ready to go, ready for us to get a presence in that state catalog. Um, I shared the content and its delivery through, uh, they deliver it through Blackboard. I shared that with this core group of teachers and they were extremely pleased with what it brings to them and to the efficiencies that it creates for them to create classes. They were even um, more, uh, more positive about the fact that they could delete content, they could add content, they could add their own assessments. The, it, this content comes with assessments, but they could change those out at any time. If we were to break away from JST, we keep what we've worked on already, but obviously they take what, what is theirs. I mean, that's rightfully their material, but we keep what is, what is ours. Um, they also make sure it's internet savvy. So it's coming to us ready to go for kids to take and for teachers to teach. Um, and I'll mention the cost effectiveness shortly. Finally, what's important about this provider <clears throat> is that what they're bringing as far as Blackboard goes, um, connected to a provider we already use, Aventa, our current e-learning facilitators are already familiar with this system, and many of our students who are taking these classes, we've standardized on this provider called Aventa, and it's the same system. So it's not a shock to our students it simply becomes, when we get to the point, it simply becomes a Midland Public Schools teacher teaching the class as opposed to somebody else. So we have the content coming in. Um, we have this, this provider. And the next question became, what classes are we really going to look at? What classes should we pursue? What are, what are our greatest needs? So then we asked this follow-up question, what classes are being requested? So we took first semester statistics of this school year. And we purchased from outside providers, from the Genesee ISD or from Michigan Virtual University, 131 classes as of December 11th. I don't have second semester stats yet. We're still compiling those. But it was 131 classes um, first semester. A quick breakdown on where those classes are. We had a JCC class that we had a need for. The Jefferson Middle School was actually one seat time waiver student. Um, but if you look at the high schools, they're only four wow. classes apart. So the online learning is becoming more popular. And the, and the need is there. Let's take a more detailed look at what courses are being requested by students. I'm going to go through each content area uh, briefly. In language arts, we have everything from 11th grade English, American literature, composition class. There's some English classes that are in there, journalism, and so on, mystery and science fiction and mythology and folklore that students have requested. Now, keep in mind, some of these classes are the seat time waiver students, those students who don't come to our campuses whatsoever. So you know, if you're wondering about especially the English 3A, which is junior English, or English 4A, which is senior English, those are most likely classes associated with the seat time waiver student. Um, but I'd like to mention, going with this content provider, uh, JST, of that whole list, the only course that we would have to build on our own from the ground up would be whatever the content is of that American literature course and a speech course. So you can see already right out of the chute, we could get a middle public schools teacher teaching our kids right away in language arts. Math, there's the spike for AP statistics. <coughs> but, uh, like I mentioned, that's something Millen High has used for quite some time as an offering for math students that have exhausted all of our math offerings. But of all of these math offerings, going with JST, the only course we would have to build from the ground up is going to be probability <coughs> and statistics. Everything else, we could get our teachers engaged in teaching our students. In science, uh, we have the whole uh, realm of science shown up there. If we were to going with JST, the only course we would have to build from the ground up is anatomy and physics and an AP physics course. Now, I do want to mention before going into social studies, I just got an email today, as a matter of fact, from our rep from JST sharing with me, I believe it was 60 new classes that they added to the catalog. 
So some of these classes that I'm saying we may not have to build could have been added to that space. So I have to have to look at that in a little more detail. Social studies, the whole gamut of social studies classes, we can begin teaching right away with JS2. We don't have to build any of these from the ground up. And world language. Um, American Sign Language, like I said, is becoming more and more popular for students. It's, it's a course that students can take for their world language requirement. Um, so more are becoming interested in that. Chinese has always been popular. But everything else, we could have one of our world language teachers teaching, with the exception of the ASL and, and Chinese. First of all, for those two classes, we'd have to find somebody certified. Um, but then if we did, we'd have to be building from the ground up. We have some elective courses out there. Um, we'd be able to offer all of these elective courses that students have asked for, career explorations, entrepreneurship, fitness, game design, and so on through that list. Okay, the next part of the remodeling is the costs. I mentioned to you that we're buying these courses currently from either the Genesee ISD or Michigan Virtual University. And currently, these are our costs. We have about $25,000 going to the Genesee ISD for the first semester as of December 11, 2014, and another 13 going to Michigan Virtual University. The small slice of the pie that is the Amazon component, there are some textbook requirements that, that these classes do have, and so typically I order them direct from Amazon. It's very easy. Uh, if we had the textbook in-house, obviously we would just use that, but more often than not, it's, that's not the case. I think the more telling graph of of the more telling information is this graph. When we first started e-learning in 2009, 2010, we were spending about $9,500. And you can see the growth over the course of the years through now. And we have spent almost $40,000 in first semester. So doing easy math, thinking that those kids are typically taking a first semester course and then either need to take the second semester or the full year if they can't get back in the classroom, or maybe there's some other needs that, that pop up. The easiest way to think about it is to double that. And we'd be looking at almost $80,000 of classes that, we would be, that we're purchasing, especially if we continue this trend. If we don't remodel and get into this game, um, we could be spending a whole lot of money on classes that our teachers are not teaching, not teaching our students. So going with JST. It becomes very cost effective. And I've highlighted flat rate with our teachers. And what that means is uh, the more that we get our teachers facilitating these courses, for a minimum of 125 students, it's only $89 a student. That's compared to the $300 a semester class um, for uh, one of the providers, and in some cases, closer to $350, $375 for some other providers as well. So if we get our teachers in this game, we can bring this content to the district for $89 a student. The more students we get involved or accounts or into the system, it becomes even uh, less expensive. But the key component to that, it's our teachers teaching in that blended environment or that online environment that I shared with you before. Now, obviously there's going to be a transition period. If we need, if we have a need and we don't have a teacher on board, for the sake of conversation, I'll pick um, marketing. I know some of my teaching friends out there are going to kill me for using that as an example, but I'll do it anyway. Um, if for some reason we don't have a teacher to teach marketing yet, they're not ready, they need to go through some PD or something like that, we can ask JST to provide us a teacher, just like what we're doing right now. Nothing different, but they're only going to charge us $125 per course per semester. Compare that to the Genesee ISD cost of 270 or the MVU cost of 299 The previous numbers that I gave are from some other providers that we've used out of the Genesee ISD. So I apologize for those inflated numbers. Those are those are the accurate ones. Is, is that price that you just mentioned student <coughs> number student count dependent? Pardon me? Is that are those last prices you just mentioned student count dependent? Um, it's dependent. Uh, yeah. If I have two kids versus a hundred, it costs the same. Right. Total. Yes. Absolutely. That's not per student. Okay. Yes, yeah. So it's. It's it, the, the bottom line, they, they have to charge for at least 125 and then we can get that right. So if we had 30 students, we would get it for the $89 a student rate. And I also need to mention too that that is basically an all the classes you can take model for, um, for charging. So let's say 
Uh, I'll take my daughter Camden, for example. She's nowhere near high school, but if she ever did, and you know, when she gets there, she wanted to take an algebra class and then algebra two or something all in the same semester or in a compacted way. It's not $89 per class structure. That's just a one time, one student involved. There we go. The 175 per course per semester, that is if we do need their teacher, yeah. and that is then algebra is $175, algebra two, an additional and all, $175. But the important point, no matter how we do this, if we, using this company and our MPS teachers, we're looking at an almost $70,000 savings, but more importantly, bolded and underlined, ensuring our MPS quality. Um, it's no, it's no secret that we have had some students come back to us and say, I don't belong in this environment at all. I, I can't do this. I don't like it. It's not the way our teachers teach. And we say, we understand that. We're working on that. We're trying to get our teachers and the quality. Um, if we didn't have a large number of teachers, and let's say we just use JST, we could still save a lot of money using their teachers as opposed to um, working through the Genesee ISD or MVU. Now, there's going to be some classes that JST doesn't offer that we're going to have to fall back on the Genesee ISD or MVU, um, but our goal is to have the bulk of our classes come out of our contract with, with JST. Um, there's, a, there's a whole myriad of other positives for going with JST. I've already, I'm going to highlight the three that I've highlighted. They're easily manipulated by our teachers. Uh, anything we make, we keep and they update their part of their content on their own. So we don't, so our teachers don't get pulled away uh, from the students to manage the course like they would if we built this from the ground up. The uh, JST monitors the content and makes sure that it's up to date, links are working and so on. Now, that being said, whatever we create, we do have to monitor, but it's a lot smaller percentage in those courses to, to manage. Okay, so that's, that's our vision. I have made some recommendations to the agenda group, and actually some of these uh, have already uh, uh, come to, to, we've come to realize. Uh, contract with JST for content. Um, I have been in contact with our representative, Mr. Gary Kuhn, from there. We have signed an agreement with them, and our next step is to get our teachers diving into that content to see what they need to do to um, manipulate it and make it our own. Make it, give it that MPS stamp of approval. Um, identify more teachers and more courses to teach online. I have a couple of yellow bullets there for the remainder of 14-15. Um, I, uh, I have the project that I've talked about, the staff development project, uh, but we also have um, some 2A money coming to us from a recent amendment that we've turned into the state that was approved to expand a little bit. Um, along the lines of all of this, I recommend we need to provide opportunities and supports that our at-risk kids need so that they stay with us. There are some students that are just getting frustrated and walking out our doors, and we all know what happens when students walk out our doors. So trying to find those supports, trying to find ways <coughs> for our, our at-risk population to stick with them in the public schools. And having our teachers teach these classes, that's a carrot right there. Um, I write continued staff development proposals for teachers to work on their courses, uh, preparation for implementation. And that's really to work with a small group of students this summer to actually get a, a pilot in place before we hit the full semester in the fall. Um, and I have a staff development proposal out there pending at this time for that. And then uh, we want to supplement, actually I just mentioned that, uh, supplement our summer two 2015 offerings. Uh, also we want to um, work with information systems counselors, our current e-learning facilitators and administrators. We need to create efficiencies in these programs. We have so many uh, spider webs going every which way right now. Consolidating this, bringing this to one place will really, will really help us out. Um, I am currently working on applying for our own Midland Public Schools seat time waiver. And what that means, we currently operate under the Genesee ISD seat, statewide seat time waiver and that comes with its set of rules. Well, we've done this long enough now. We know what our students need. We know what resources that w we have. And it's time to write our set of rules to follow for our, our seat time waivers. And so um, that will help us use some of our ingenuity resources that we already have uh, to help some of our at-risk population who may take advantage of seat time waiver um, along with the new JST courses coming into play. And finally, we need a presence in the state catalog. 
If everybody else can do it, <clears throat> so can we. The Midland Public Schools can, can be out there. Um, you know, I, I think we've, we've said before that we're not out to take anybody's students by any mean, by any means, but if we're able to provide a service to other school districts that may not have the resources to provide certain options for kids, um, it's a way for us to, to be part of that. <clears throat> a lot of information about remodeling. Uh, a lot of information, a lot of different topics thrown at you tonight about remodeling. Um, but that's, that's what we're hoping to do with our e-learning department uh, moving forward. Questions? Questions. There's going to be a bunch. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have a whole page full of notes <laughs> I've <laughs> made. My, my <clears throat> First one is, for the pilot programs that you've done so far, have you charted any academic results? Have they been performing better, uh, maybe struggling more in the new environment, or how has that panned out? If you well, know. yeah, you know, it's we've we've had um, we, we've looked at success and and we've had some students, excuse me, um, excel in this environment because they can't move at their own pace. Okay. Uh, we have other students on the totally opposite side of that spectrum, and it's it's really it's not for everybody, and we pitch it that way right out of the chute. Um, the counselors, I think, do a fantastic job when a kid walks in. And either they have to bring it up to them as an option, or if the student says, I, I would like this option, they begin getting a, a quick session on this is not for everybody. So we, I have seen both sides of the spectrum. Okay. Seat time waivers especially. We have some athletes that have been you know, going to different places to study their craft, extremely successful. And on the other side of that, students who have decided to come back to school to our face-to-face -face classrooms because it was more challenging in some cases. OK. Um. Uh, and I'll just ask you one more, and then I'll pass the torch, and I'll, we'll get back to me. Um, how many classes do we need to offer to be competitive in the virtual world or in the state catalog, I think, as you um, put it? That's a good question. Um, I mean, so people out there know who we are. How many do we need to, to get in the books? As far as a, a number to be successful, I, I guess I'm not real sure. I can't speak to that. But I think it's important that we at least get you know, a, a beginning uh, look out there you know and honestly we can teach these classes that this provider brings to us right out of the box per se we don't have to do anything remember they're already MME aligned they're common core aligned and so on so our teachers could begin teaching them without doing any work with them um, but I think it's in our best interest to um, to begin looking at them but as we stand right now we can't put any of the current courses into the state catalog because they don't belong. They're, they're not ours. We haven't contracted with anybody. Right. And also that state catalog has very specific definitions on separation of, of time and space. And everything that we do right now requires some face-to-face -face options. OK. Angela? I guess mine was kind of, you kind of touched on it in your first question. It was about what type of metrics you've set up to actually analyze if my son takes an online class versus, I mean, you said some kids it's not for them and others it is, but Correct. the kids that take it and think, hey, this is great, how though are you monitoring how they're doing in these classes versus an actual classroom? Because it is such yeah. a different style. You know, you're buying a right. canned program and you say the teacher can go in and, you know, change it, but what if they don't? How are you really making sure that it's apples to apples with what we would normally offer in our school district as far as the level of quality and the, the way that the kids are learning? Because you're probably having to teach a little bit different way, but how are you really measuring that over the, you know, over time right. that they're That's getting the same education that we all expect from what they're getting right now in the regular right. classroom? That's our biggest challenge, quite frankly, is setting up those metrics because this, this environment is changing drastically all the time. And also we have so many more students involved. And our focus has been credit recovery for the most part. And so students who have already been in our face-to-face -face classrooms who have failed the class and they're retaking it. Um, uh, my, my best and most honest answer to you is that we're, we're working on tracking that results right now. Um, and we're trying to figure out what are the best ways to do that. Um, you know, it's. A lot of the feedback that we've worked with has really been anecdotal in nature. Students going back to their counselors and counselors calling me and saying, OK, this is working, this isn't working. Um, also, the content that's out there. Some, some students have, have loved the content. Some students have hated it. Um, being able to take our teacher leaders, for example, or back when we started six years ago, we had a curriculum specialist for every core area 
and they did go through our edgenuity program and they went through to make sure that that rigor was there that we were aligned and so on and now it's it's almost near impossible with all of the options that are out there especially those 18,000 options that are potentially out there it's it's difficult to find the alignment it's difficult to uh, find out if we're really comparing apples to apples or if we're comparing apples to oranges in a lot of cases and what we want to do is move toward that uh, that space where we do know our teachers are teaching our content in a different delivery method so we can better answer that question um, and and so I guess we're you know like I said from the bottom of my heart the best answer is, is we're working on that but I think we can give better data if we get our teachers teaching the classes so we can ensure that alignment and that quality What do we do for students who want to take these classes, but don't have the means at home, maybe to have access to a computer or internet service? Are they turned away, or what do we do for students uh, like that? You know, honestly, we, that's one of the first um, ideas that they talk about, counselors talk about. Okay, if you're going to take this class, you know, do you have internet, computer at home? Um, each one of the classes that we've purchased, um, the, those students are actually scheduled into the e-learning lab at each, at each high school. So they have at least an hour a day that they have a reserved seat in front of a computer to work on work on that class. Now the seat time waiver students, those who don't come into our buildings, they are always welcome. I mean, they're not banned from the building you know, by any means, um, but they can come in and work. But that's the first thing we ask them. We ask, do you have a, a good computer? Do you have an internet connection at home? And we have that conversation with them right off, right off the shoot. All right, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have, I have a couple more macro questions. Um, you said something so far, you know, all this is learning how to do something. And it's been mostly strategically aligned to credit recovery. Right. Okay, so how do we select courses? How do we teach? How do we do all of that around credit recovery? And that's interesting and needed, obviously. What thought has been given to what does our overall curriculum need to look like in our offerings, and what should be offered this way versus traditional classrooms? Okay, uh, I think Mandarin speaks to that a little bit. Sure. You know, I saw all these things, but what, what is the macro thinking behind what are we doing to recover <clears throat> courses we already offer that kids haven't picked up on or need help with versus what should we be offering that we don't offer today that would keep kids here or attract kids here? Well, I think the it's, this is going to fill in the gaps where, where they're blocked from courses that we know by singletons first. That's one b op reason they're going to look at these c courses, and already kids are. It's because we're blocked, because I'm a AP kid, and I'm taking AP or an IB course in a band cast class, and I have three singletons in the schedule, and I have a block. Now I can take this blend it out, outside the day and be able to fit that in. That's one. Okay. Schedule, then, schedule adaptation. Schedule. Mm -hmm. The second part I think um, you just touched on is things like Mandarin. Yep. So the growth of some of those courses that we're not able to offer and don't have going forward, I think that's the other piece of it. Go on. Absolutely. Yeah. But we're, we're, we don't have a grand plan towards as much as dabbling to understand how things would work and go forward. Well, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, the, the plan is is to, uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do right now is look at the course scheduling process, what's actually happening in the buildings right now, to see what classes are being requested by the students and looking to see what the greatest demand is um, in preparation for staffing to see how all that um, shakes out. Um, you know, looking at, at what we might need and then looking at those classes first through that process and seeing what, what's our greatest need. Okay. And the blended side, it's also got to have to do with the structures who are going to, the early adapters, what instructors are out there that want to, to adapt this in the beginning into their, tr into their tricks of the trade. Okay. <coughs> and, and obviously we're not the first ones hogs of the trough in this game nationally. Uh, you've surveyed some folks in Michigan for tools they've used, et cetera. Have you gone to places like, looked at what Silicon Valley in terms of their macro approach, not just their selection of providers, et cetera? but how they're managing curriculum, how they're managing course offerings, how they're managing credit recoveries, how they're, how they're offering things kids wouldn't have gotten otherwise. 
you know, we don't have to plow that ground. Someone's got to be really good at it out there. Right. That we can go copy paste. Any yeah. any effort there yet? Not yet. A lot of it's been what can we do to get our teachers involved the quickest because that 260 number, you know, just basically taking 130 times two, um, really trying to get our teachers teaching our kids rather than sending them out to somebody else first. And then that's a great next step. Okay. Those, those are my macro questions. Um, one thing that is of concern but not of concern, uh, and you'll understand my question here in a minute. Sure. We've created this whole historic infrastructure of curriculum approvals and development, right? I mean, it's, you can overstate it's over Midlandized to many degrees. You know, it takes tons of approvals and people to, to manage it, and it comes to us for approval on curriculum, major change proposals or major curriculum changes. Now all of a sudden we're over in this space and we're projecting a provider and we're having some people look at this. Not that I'm saying the other was mm. efficient or necessarily ultra wise, but it kept you from making mistakes. Mm -hmm. What keeps us from making mistakes over here when we don't go through that same rigor? It's somewhat going through the same, and maybe even more rigor. So it's got understand. the rigor of the third party provider looking at it and aligning it to, to all the state standards and common core and MME and, and then and then our people are also looking at it and, okay. and studying it before okay. it becomes. Now would that come to us for approval, not that we're all that insightful, but just in terms of the diligence. If it becomes our, our we're providing with our teachers, it hasn't when it's um, purchased from a Genesee ISD, right. because it's not ours. It's all, yeah, hands off. Yep. Right. But if he's buying it from JST and it becomes our teacher and we're providing. And I think one of the biggest issues to, to point out is when we are purchasing these courses from a gen net, from a 21 net, from any outside third party, we've lost exactly what you're talking about there. We have no control over that teacher, over that curriculum. Right. And frankly, that's something I'm completely uncomfortable with. Yes, that, that should and make us all uncomfortable. Because well, that, it doesn't now go I know through. control, we don't have any say. But right. Sure. So you know. You're, you're out. You're just The kids the can choose to do it, and we have no say, sure. and, we, and we must pay for it. Exactly. It, it, those scores still come to us. Those students still have to progress through our system. And the rapid explosion, I think the most telling chart was the one where we had almost a, a near vertical growth on that. And, and we can't be ostrich with our head in the sand yep. and saying, this isn't going to keep going that way. Using a content provider such as this allows us to take that content as our framework, take that, match it up to the curriculum that you have all already approved. So we can take that, align it to you, the curriculum that we've you already just said approved. The key thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then we can offer that out to our students, A, with the curriculum that you all have approved, and B, with an instructor that we know is highly qualified Perfect. and that we evaluate as well, too. So we know our students are taking these classes. We're concerned about the quality of it. We think and we know that our teachers are of high quality and our administrators are evaluating our teachers. We want to bring this back up under our control while still allowing students to be able to maintain choice in a time where um, fiscal issues are restraining choice. Yep. So per this perfect. will allow us to, to do that. Brian, Brian, that's the perfect answer and approach. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, what? As we go through all this effort, we're you know stemming the bleeding to some degree of people running to God knows who and selecting from the menu. What will we be offering? What will we be? What will be our point of differentiation that a kid would rather take it from us in a blended environment than going to an online environment somewhere else? Well, how do we differentiate that in a kid's and parent's mind as they're doing their scheduling, etc.? Well, I, I, and Chris can answer his way. I'll answer mine. Um, when you go into the course catalog right now, a good majority of them are Michigan Virtual and Ingenuity courses. And it's Gen CISD as well as Gen CISD and, and Gen that. And so um, our brand, our teachers, our brand. Correct. And I okay. think that was our thoughts when we were doing this. That's exactly it. And I had a chance on a classroom observation to talk to some students, some programming students actually. And they were they couldn't get into the programming course face to face for because of singleton reasons. So we got them this option. Well, they were talking to their friends who were taking the what was to be the exact same course with the teacher on you know, in our school, and they were comparing notes and they were very unhappy with what they were doing in online learning. So we've heard it directly from the kids, and the message basically is we want our teachers, but we just couldn't get them. Okay. For scheduling. So the branding matches the approach. Correct. 
right. that right. gives us the point of differentiation. Okay. <clears throat> I think Angela touched on this already, but I would highly advocate stepping back a little bit and start thinking about how we're going to measure the data that suggests what's going well, what's not going well, how our kids do yeah. with the, the total online go subcontract it to somebody independently versus what we're offering it would be very You have an automatic built-in one. I mean, everything's, if we like it or not. In the end is measured. the end. Is, uh, the measurement's you given to us with our state assessment. You just got to cut so it. So all you have to do is cut it, and Brian has a, a warehousing tool, a data director tool okay. that, cut, that cuts that. It's not data director now. Sorry about that. And, and again, this is, this is as valuable, and there's be a direct correlation to the training that you give your teachers. Um, they, they need to be very well trained in how to implement this system. Yes. And Chris is a recognized state expert in doing that. So we're blessed to have an in-state expert. He teaches how to teach online courses to teachers throughout the state um, as a part of the Ramsey Blick um, um, Consortium. And so we're, we're blessed to have that internally. And I think that the um, higher degree of training that you can give the teachers, the better results that you're going to get. And the metrics behind it is, is a work in progress, but data is what we do, and we'll be able to pull those metrics out um, in due time and to be able to vet to make sure that they get the same quality experience online as they are in the classroom. Okay. Uh, Mr. Turpin? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's appropriate at this point. My daughter is taking four online classes one at Dow High, and the other three at Secret She's taking four classes for three different providers, and anecdotally from her, caliber of the classes, quality of the instruction, quality of the materials is all over the map. I don't think, I think to answer your question, Jerry, it's very simple. Even, even with economics aside, I would want to see these classes with online content brought under Midland teacher because they have a direct connection to the teacher, they have direct accountability to the teacher in the system as opposed to I mean, one of these classes doesn't even give us, as parents, a way to monitor the class. And I'm like, you mean I can't even go in and get a report on how she's doing? I don't get that. So I think the accountability shows up as soon as you hand it over to a middle and teacher. Okay. Where we're missing the accountability is the external provider, not of the content, but of the instructor. Okay, so that'll be our point of differentiation. It's a very relevant. But well, thank you. Thank you. Very, thank you. Just what Brian was talking about, bringing it under our curriculum, under our teachers, it can be our, at our, with our name and quality will be the point of differentiation of why parents will want to take that versus Precisely. running off to Gen Net. Precisely. Precisely. It's, it's good for students. It's good for teachers. It's good for MPS. This is a win-win-win all the way around. There, there's no doubt. And, and I had one, one last one, then I'll hand it back over. You know, obviously, and I think it's going to always be this way, this is very high school oriented. Oh, right. right. Right now, it is, yeah. And I'm not trying to get the cart way in front of a horse. No, you're going to have to. Way in front of a horse. <laughs> but I'm just trying to be more futuristic a little bit and understanding, okay, I can see more and more of the high school stuff happening very easily. Right. Uh, I can see that can be, could be cost effective for us in the end in terms of developing curriculum. As curriculum things change, et cetera. Um, but how far are people foreseeing this heads to lower grades? And I'm is. scared to death of it, but I, I don't want to understand what people are thinking. And go ahead, Chris, tell them what the law it really says. Well, the seat time waiver law is 612 right now. So uh, that's, that's the one. When I showed the slide of where the breakdown is, there was the one Jefferson Middle School, yep. six classes. Mm -hmm. That's a middle school student. So our middle school students can take advantage of, wow. of the seat time waiver. Um, the 21F component that I shared with you is also 612. Um, so, you know, middle school students can take advantage of that. Um, just hot off the presses, I haven't even had a chance to, to check it out myself yet. Um, the state came out with K-5 eligibility for seat time waivers. Really? Hmm. Really? So, That's scary. And the mm -hmm. nice, uh, what, what I can... Uh, well, the good part of it. And, and how it works at the elementary tends to be more what Chris's definition of what he used earlier of blended. What that means, blending in the class. Blended. Versus outside. Versus one. online. Okay. But, but also you need to know um, the ability to personalize. So think of the vast array of learners we have today mm -hmm. from our neediest children to our advanced children and to be able to personalize that. That's one of the beauties, even if that's early. How, you know, right yep. now, it's difficult to give that array to our most advanced, to our, our most needy child. Well, I, I can see it solving some problems we've historically faced. How does a 
a seventh grader who may be really advanced in math get appropriate instruction. Now we may have a mechanism that we can provide that we may not have been able to provide in the past. And I would even share, I would add the flip side <coughs> to that too, so our, our homebound students mm -hmm. as well. Yes. You know, our, our teachers are currently crafting activities for the homebound teacher to do. Well, in this case, if we could get all that content online, that way it's much more seamless <coughs> education, you know, for those students as, as well. There's, like Brian was saying, you know, win-win all over the place okay. for lots of different spectrum of students and our clientele that we have. Okay. Any well, others? Yes, I've got one, one left. One question. Um, how are the teachers reacting to all of this? Uh, the ones that you've involved so far, um, you know, give us a little insight onto what they think and will that sentiment carry to a district-wide implementation if that's what we do? The, the team that I have so far, you know, the, the six people who are together, they see this as, as the wave of the future. I mean, they see it as, as a way for them to continue reaching out to students that maybe can't get in to their classes, but also um, as new ways to be innovative, like we've already talked about, you know, how to give kids these options and these opportunities that maybe they can't get through a standard face-to-face -face classroom. You know, if, if uh, we currently, actually, Andrea Joswiak and John Cook have been working with a blended class right now that they're trying out, and that's, a, that's part of their uh, advanced business class where kids are getting an opportunity to meet with the teacher face-to-face, -face, but they're going out and getting opportunities out in the community you know as part of their work and so it's it's giving us a lot of different opportunities that teachers couldn't provide maybe just in a standard face-to-face -face. so those that group I, I'd like to say they're excited about it if they're watching and they want to correct me if I'm wrong <laughs> but but all the feedback from them has been has been very positive in nature um, I've done this particular presentation to our administrative cabinet to our teacher leader group and to a series of other groups and at first of course, you mentioned online learning, and people, just by human nature, have some negative ideas about it. When you talk it through, like we have tonight, then they can see some of the directions and opportunities that it gives for kids. Mm -hmm. and, and I like to use the term, and I used it at the very beginning, modern tools for instruction. Modern tools. And really, it's, it's a modern tool for instruction. It's a modern philosophy for instruction. And, um, and it's, it's, I think our teachers see that it's what our clientele is asking for in some cases. Not everybody, but it's becoming more and more popular in conversations. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks, well, Chris. One of, the, one of the key things that I've learned tonight was the differentiation between online and blended. I mean, okay. I knew what they were, but mm -hmm. hadn't clearly thought what that means to our students, that any one of our students today can go shop online for a course. And that could be anybody, any time Dick and Harry that gets their name on the list. And you know, that's wide open. We have no control and no say, and they can do what they want to do. Except we pay for it. Except we pay for it. And we may pay for it in the poor results on both ends. Right, right. And what's nice about this is it's really just extending our classroom. When you talk about putting ours out there, yeah. what I got nervous I was going to hear is that we're going to put an online course out there that somebody can take online from Timbuktu. I don't think I heard that, right? Nope. Well, what I'm hearing is what our kids can take in a blended environment. Our kids can take those, but we're going to try to... No, no, we can draw from other districts. Vice right? versa. Can yeah. somebody take ours yes. online well, without any yes. interface? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. But our plan is not driven by that. to do that, and that's because our point of differentiation is going to be very difficult in developing an online course that's going to compete with the thousands of other online courses that people are developing full-time. Right. But what you're really offering is the blended course with our curriculum, our brand, Serving our kids. Serving our mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's what I wanted to take away from this before right. we first started. If, if we go to all the work of creating these courses, they could be delivered in a 100% online format and go into that state catalog and fit that definition. Understood. But that's not That's the ancillary to the real mission. Precisely. Okay. Great. Any others? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you time. very much. Thanks. The subject, what we're spending some time on, Mike. Yeah. Two resolutions today, and I'll do the first one, and uh, um, I think Bob did the second one. First one is the bond authorization resolution. So this is um, where our financial consultant, Starter Barch, and our bond counsel, um, Truin, and our underwriter, Stiefel, have all worked together on, on the uh, resolution in order to sell our bonds on April 22 or April 23. I'm mixing the dates in there somewhere. And, and just for clarity's sake, this is relatively pro forma. 
yes. at this stage. Yes. It's a legal requirement to begin marketing yep. the bond. If you had your bond counsel there at the table, yep. and your underwriter, and um, um, uh, your finance consultant all working on this. So Good. feel rest assured it's been through several steps. So um, to proceed, we do not need to read the resolution per se. No. Um, Neither one of these oh, resolutions need to be read all the way through. Roll call on the second one, though. Yeah, okay, I was going to do roll call on both, but we'll do we'll, not have to do on the first okay. one. Okay, so let any questions to Mike on the first one? Well, we'll take one at a time here. Any questions to Mike on that first one? No. I'm good. No, no. Okay, can I take a motion to approve the resolution? I motion to approve resolution 5.1, the bond authorization. Support? Support. Move. 5.1, moved by Pam, support by Angela. Uh, we'll just move into a voice vote. In that case, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Back to you. That's when I'll turn over to Matt. Yeah, the second uh, thing you're looking at, best <coughs> practice resolution. Um, we've had this the last two or three years. Uh, it has slowly gone down in what the state provides back to us. $52 last year, $50 per student. This year, we have to agree to, or we're, we're stating, that we meet seven out of the nine best practices. That's the minimum, and we do. Uh, you have the document in your packet. Um, it changes from year to year as to what the best practices are. Some are the same, but where's, there could be where's two Mr. Or Glenn when I need him? There could be two or three new <laughs> right. best, best practices when they go. We're about number 35 best practice, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> um, it was. It's already been uh, anticipated, and it was in the budget, so it's not like going to be found money, but. We have to wait for the year to get started to make sure we can attest to the fact that we are offering and meeting all those. Brings in roughly 350 to 400,000 with our number of students. Um, so far, if you're looking ahead at all, um, I think the governor's proposal has it down to $20. 20. So it's dropped another 30, and it's actually a, a different list again on the initial yeah. one. It's like two right. sets of three that you have to look at. So it does change. A lot of them we've done before. It's, it's interesting. Uh, one of the ones we meet is is that we do offer the online courses or blended learning opportunities, and you know it's things like posting links on our website, like we do to most our budget and to uh, data on testing, uh, all the usual things you've seen. There's also a new one about uh, offering one credit worth of non-English language learning experience. If you read the details, it's before um, high, school. high school, so you're really looking at the students that can take. French, German, Spanish, while they're still in middle school. So, like I said, it changed a little bit, but it, this one does require a, a roll call about to approve. I'll accept the motion first. I'll move that we adopt uh, 5.2. Moved by Scott. Support? Second. Support by Yvonne. Any more questions or comments? See none. Uh, All right. Madam Vice President, will you call the roll? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Vice President Branstadt? Yes. Treasurer Singer? Yes. Member Frizzy? Yes. Member Gorton? Yes. Member McFarland? Yes. So six. Six. Six out of six. Six <coughs> out of six. <coughs> yes. Thank you. Do we have to extend our meeting? Um, yes. We, oh, I'll take a motion to extend our meeting, what, half hour, Mike, to cover it? Um, 45 minutes to so cover. If you're familiar with your end time, that, why you're making that motion better than I am, what is the end time? Oh, we got to go closed session. No, right. So what, what is it? Why 9 30 is our yep. scheduled end time, so we need to make a motion to extend. We don't have too many questions, too many comments at the end. We hey, half hour. It doesn't hurt to work. go too long, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll accept the motion to go to 10 30. Okay. You're not getting we don't have, me. We don't have to wait for the second. <laughs> if we get done at that, five till, it doesn't matter. So, all right. <laughs> Support. Who's moving? Oh, oh, all right. I'll move Pam. to extend the meeting till 10.30. Okay. Support? And, and you, can, you can kick me on the way out of it last that long. <laughs> all right. I'm short the rest of the way here. Yeah. Support. Support by Patrick. All in favor say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Scott. <laughs> okay, we are extended till 10.30. It is my son's birthday today. March budget amendment <laughs> adjustments. Mr. Cooper again. I, I heard Pam move that one. Right. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Begrudgingly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She goes past she's Let the record show, that, the record show that Scott's <laughs> vote was begrudging <laughs> also. <laughs> I knew it was going to be a long one, but I did not plan for the first part of the meeting. Yes. So. <laughs> What we have in front of you are typically what you experienced before, but it's the budget adjustment time. 
from the one that you adopted last uh, end of June, early July. Um, and uh, so we're going to do it here uh, in March, as you normally do. And again, we'd have one final adjustment in June at, at the end of that time. Uh, before I get too far into it, just as a, uh, a new person doing this, without Carol Love uh, helping around here, i got to give credit where credit's due. <laughs> She's the one that uh, knows the procedures and uh, get the details sometimes when, when I was still working on that part. So it's very helpful along with the rest of the business office. Uh, like always, the timeline I want to start with, just to show you where at, because it starts to co-mingle if you think about it, the two budgets. you got the one that we're currently working in, and you're already thinking ahead as your people talk, and we've been thinking all year towards the next one. So I tried to color code there a little bit, but tonight is the, the mid-year budget uh, revision, and then we switched on by the 20th, the next board meeting, uh, we're into a budget workshop that's looking forward to the next one. And then, and, and I'm going to, Monique, be coming to you about this a little bit, uh, our two board meetings, one of the months that we have to is June. Uh, when you look at them, especially the second one, but maybe even the first one, we're, we really are much earlier in the month. And the problem with that's going to be is if you want accurate numbers both on the closing out of the old budget plus the adoption of the new one, because if you remember even a year ago they were changing things within June, we really should think in terms of it would be nice if that last one was the last Monday in June, like the 29th, and uh, one in the first we can do, but if it was a little later, it wouldn't hurt, but I'll uh, talk to the agenda group and we'll bring that back to the board to at least look at. It can be done, but the 15th, for example, is just, uh, would be the, uh, the following Monday after school's out, and that's when we're, uh, with some of the teachers, with some of our staff, the way they're paid during the school year, there's a lot of stuff, and all, simply what it would mean is your budgets just aren't as accurate. And uh, that's something we've always liked to know where we are, so I'll just throw that out there. Okay, well, the major factors, and we'll try to keep it at that level because there's lots of detail that we've been sharing with FFO and, and board members at different times. But the major factors that affected our budget adjustments is, first of all, that we had a much smaller decrease in student enrollment than we budgeted for, um, approximately 100 less students. So that was the biggest increase in revenue as we go. Uh, we were typically budgeting for losing 150 students. We've kind of yo-yoed the last couple of years. If you go back a year, we lost 300 when we thought we were going to lose 150, and this year we lost 50 when we thought we were going to lose 150. It's always nice. Hopefully it's a trend going forward. Uh, makes a difference when you go in there. It's still a decrease. I don't want you to think we added students. We just lost them at a slower rate, and that's, that's a good thing. Uh, budgets re have been reduced uh, before June. That's kind of important. One of the things that Carol did when we met with people is we really wanted to make sure at this adjustment time, especially with the bond sales coming up pretty quick here and with all our uh, groups that we have to negotiate with, we wanted our financials basically as tight as we could have them. Typically, you would see more variance in the budget at the end of the year in June, so you would see a bigger swing. We, we kind of went and talked to people and said, we, we can see you haven't spent that money there. Are you going to need it? In the past, they might have hung on to that all the way to June. We just convinced them a little bit that maybe we could change that in March to see where we are. The biggest difference just means when you're used to in June seeing 3% variance in the expenditures, it will not be there because we've already uh, taken some of that now. But it gives us, a, I think, a much better financial picture both in establishing the next budget, knowing where we are now for the bonds and for our negotiations. We also have um, volatility in the state funding. If you remember last year, it was between the two board meetings that some of the funding changed. We finally got from the state how they were going to fund, and it didn't match any of the things that Linda always would show you. The executive approach, the state, the House, excuse me, the Senate and the House, and none of those came true. It was something totally different. So it can change. Um, also, for example, uh, this year we had some qualification for what's called 51C money. It's based on previous years and how much money special education has been costing the district, and then they reimburse you with that and finally caught up with us. We spent enough that they gave us some money back. And so that showed up. And also, just as late as this last January, there's some money out there called 147D money. It's uh, maybe heard where the governor signed an executive order to stop a payment that they weren't scheduled to make. Well, it was one of these things where it really it's in and out kind of money, comes in for retirement, goes right back out to the retirement system. Um, we didn't get it on our early payments. It showed up finally on the state aid to us. Uh, looked like we were going to get 600 and I think it was 17 and we ended up getting 112 in the first payment and then 
mysteriously it disappeared after that. Kind of held for a couple months. They said they were working on computer bugs, and then by the time we hit February, that dropped. So uh, we fed some more volatility and state funding that's made a difference. And then changes in special education, both on the revenue and expense side. As you know, um, quite a few of what we do through special education also goes through the ESA. And, and they run many of the programs. And uh, both in, on the revenue side and on the expense side, they've, they've had some bigger swings than we've seen in the past in this year. I mean, from the start of the year, from their budget start till now. And so it's not in our direct control, and that's a factor when you look at some of the things that we did for budget adjustments. All right, so major revenue changes. Again, these are higher level looks at things. We did get um, a Medicaid uh, reimbursement from the ESA um, from prior years. So it wasn't just for this year, but prior years. Um, I think that's supposed to be the end of them now. Um, I say that, and you might get another little one someplace, but that's kind of making up for previous years. Um, there's that 147D money. We didn't expect it to come. Then we thought 600 was coming, and now uh, we at least got the 112,000. So that's money that that we took in. Um, Act 18 revenue and special education revenue from the ESA. You see the capital letter C next to it. While we got increased revenues from Act 18, when I show you the expenditures, there's it's not one for one. The expenditures much exceed the revenue, but it is. It kind of came in and is going right back out because of the increased expenses. Uh, federal grants are always pass-throughs. Whatever you see in income, and we did get more, goes right back out because you have to spend it dollar for dollar. If you don't um, after time, you have to give that back to the federal government. Um, the foundation allowance, due to the uh, excessive special ed costs from the previous years, that's what we talked about before, uh, the 51C money uh, amounts to quite a bit. And then, of course, the last one is really that foundation allowance due to additional enrollment. That's a pretty big chunk of, of the money that we're talking about. But we were able to identify $2 million in additional revenue than we had planned in the original budget. Okay. Be nice if I could stop that slide and say we didn't identify. <laughs> yeah, let's years. call it good. Just, just, just call it good for the night. But uh, major expense changes, and you'll see both. There are additional ones, and there are ones that we found reductions in. So uh, one of the things, and you heard Mr. Chair talk about it at the time, um, that uh, staff changes, salaries, and benefits, we're able to reduce expenses 435,000. Some of those are when we have a position that we don't fill. Most of those were administratively, but it's also if you have left any of the employee groups, less paraprofessionals, uh, uh, teaching position, um, if they leave, um, like you heard a teacher's gonna leave tonight and we'll fill that with a sub the rest of the way because it's mid-year, you can't uh, find one for that short time, so it's there. Um, you'll see we had some additional expenses in workman's comp. Um, with the bond, as soon as that passed, we were able to find some money in technology that we won't have to spend this year because we know we'll be able to take it out of the bond proceeds pretty quickly. Um, the federal grants I told you about, the offset, so it's, an, it's additional expenditures, but we got it back in on the revenue side. Uh, we did go around, the, the arm twisting is where we got the 365, um, where we asked for, you know, what do we have now that you know you're not going to spend? And people were very good about that. Uh, the billing I told you about from the special ed, that Act 18, if you remember, it was like 186000 coming in, but they're looking for an additional 562000 So. That's what I mean by the, the volatility of what we don't control sometimes. <coughs> and then uh, at the time, the health cost insurance, uh, we think that we need to have an additional 150 sitting there just to match. It's always hard to tell when you're self-funded if it'll actually be there, but it's additional expense we wanted to account for because that would be kind of normal with what we think we've got and seen so far. But that can vary from time to time. So you can see we had some reduction in expenses there, and we also had some additions. So this is really the, the biggest view in the bottom line. That first column, uh, 1415 original, is where we stood with our budget that we approved last June 30th at the end. So you'll see what you budgeted for revenues there, about 77 million, and your expenditures were just shy of 82. And you originally, when you adopted it, uh, knew that it would be around uh, shortfall at the come out of fund balance, et cetera, of about 4.9 million. Um, as Linda would have told you at the time, there's always budget variance. We just were talking about that. People don't spend something, we get extra money in, things change. She had pegged that at about 1.6. And so th even, uh, even though it said negative uh, 4.9, it was a shortfall. We really were thinking we'd come in around negative 3.3, 3.2, right in that area. 
and that was going to give you a fund balance around five million, which is six point two percent is what you would have bid to. Now just to remember too, with a, a lot of detail, that fund balance is not all spendable. There's there's money in there that's reserved for expenses we know are coming. There's also the donation money, the money we can't spend except for it'd be like the IB money that we have in there, the PYP uh, science. Labs. There's different things that have been put in there at times. Now, where we're really sitting and what we're asking you to adopt right now is the March budget, which is the second column. And so you'll see that I told you we had increased revenue, so you're seeing those at 79, almost 79.5. You're seeing budgeted expenditures uh, a little higher when you took both the additional ones and the reductions. That's where we're sitting, but you'll notice that that brings the shortfall down to around a negative 2.7 uh, or 8, uh, which is quite a bit uh, shorter. It's even smaller than the negative 3.2 or 3 that we thought we would have. Okay, now, we still expect, and that's why there's an asterisk on there, that between March and June, we're hoping we still get some more budget variants. I don't think much in the way of revenue. That's usually not going to happen at this point. Can, but most likely won't. We're more likely looking at on the on expense side where we don't spend all that money. That's a much smaller percent. It's less than 1% we're predicted. And that's just, you know, we don't know how tight when you do that that we squeeze this time. That we're hoping that's what we'd see. So we're anticipating by the end uh, of the, this budget cycle we'd be at negative 2.2, uh, 2.1 is where we expect to be. And that, again, would leave you with a bigger fund balance, as you can see, and closer to 8.1. And, of course, the last column just kind of shows you the changes that happened in each of those. In order for that to occur through, you need to know it's been a great job out there by oh, everyone. Amazing. From, from yeah. every employee group out there up to bring that number down to where we go. We've we eliminated a number of positions along the way, which um, is support to what goes on to the classroom. So it's not, I mean, it's a good and a bad, right? And so, mm -hmm. but it was a great, great job by everybody. We're, everyone out there is wearing multiple hats and extra duties this, at this point to make this happen. No, oh, absolutely. But, uh, very good. Jeez, and of course I'm sitting here. Why do I find myself going eight point one? <laughs> right. Where right. five years ago, I'm, oh my God, eight point yes. one. Yeah, no. <laughs> right. um, just look ahead because and I, and I don't want to make it about the next step. But you got to remember, as we finish one, we'll talk about the other. So I want you thinking ahead. There, there's still a deficit there, and our intention, as you've heard Mike say many times, is to balance our budget, fifteen, sixteen. So we have been holding balance our budget meetings. So in the last week or two, Mike, Carol, and I have brought in everybody that controls the budget basically, and they talked to us about their budget um, with the starting point of not us, but the standard procedure would have been, here's how much money you have, or we've done things in the past where, okay, you, you have the same as you did, but we want you to cut 5%. We've kind of gone more like, well, what do you need? And it's been a very interesting process. It's been very informative. Um, people have been very genuine when they've come. Um, some already with ideas and prioritizations of what, where they would take or give money or where they absolutely need it. Um, ideas of things we can do together or just an idea somebody has that just doesn't spread to the other buildings. So quite a wide range of things, but that's part of our process. So hopefully, even though we know um, staffing is 86% personnel costs, uh, we're still looking hard at that 14% of other things to make sure that we've gotten everything that we <coughs> possibly can. And when you piece little pieces together, sometimes a little bigger, and it's that much less you have to take from the other side. Um, student enrollment is still going to be a key. Um, haven't been able to go through the latest projections. Um, you know, uh, earlier, if we went on prior years, we'd still be looking at 150. Hopefully, it won't be that much, but we're going to have some student enrollment decline still. The state funding, um, we really only heard the governor's proposal, both in foundation allowance and categorical aid. Talked to a couple of you, but it you know, the headlines were we'd get $75 a student extra. When you start looking at the categorical aid, it doesn't amount to that much extra. And it's kind of very similar problem to what we had a year ago, where what looked like a positive ends up, if I remember off the top of my head, it was like minus $2 mm -hmm. a student. It doesn't look like minus on the governors, but, you know, it still looks like 75 is more like 15 is, is what the fiscal agency is reporting. So that's something to think about. Staffing levels always make a difference. Um, you know, how many people, what, how, how many students do we have? Is there any efficiencies there? How many people do we have? And one thing that uh, we haven't thought much about, but it's going to start with this next calendar, there are additional instructional days. And that means we currently have 
174 instructional days in our calendar, and the state has mandated that actually it was this year unless you had a contract, but by next year you have to have 175. So you have to add at least a day, and then within the year after that you have to be at 180 instructional days. So it's with students. So it's a matter of adding those. Now the teachers currently have a 186 day contract, so we have that, but you gotta remember, all our hourly employees then are employed for longer days, and so there's a lot of extra costs you pick up as you go forward. Um, we're working on our labor agreements with all those groups, and I'm sure that's pretty familiar for you board members that have been on here. When, when they're not settled, it's harder to pin down exactly where we stand and work with those groups. Um, of course, our unaffiliated too. Uh, retirement costs. Uh, right now, Ms. Espa, uh, excuse me, MIPSERS is, uh, retirement costs are looking like they're going to hold steady with this year. It's a good thing because in the past, we have often have to worry about increase, but all the stuff they publish shows the exact same rates good thing at what was that number 25 point it's uh, some for the yeah, district if you add in their money that they're <laughs> offsetting it gets closer to 34 and a half but it's 25.7 26 depending on what plan it one's on that's how much the district pays directly and then wow. remember they're giving us some um, it's called 147 money but they give it to you it goes to the retirement system yep. you, you literally get it but you have to hand it right back, back. back to them so you have that uh, medical costs, always hard to know, up, down, uh, we're self-funded, it can be either way. And then uh, those transfers that we've talked about um, from the ESA, it's really just, you know, are we going to see more or are we going to get uh, better cost containment and so we kind of set where we're at, we know we're going to be. It's hard to know and we'll be working on that over the time. And uh, again, against the available fund balance, we'll also control somewhat of what, what we're able to do with the money that's, that's available there. Let's try that again. Okay. And that's the budget you're looking <coughs> to, and, and it, it needs to be approved by the board, but certainly you'd ask any questions, and once it's approved, like always, the presentation's on there, because the board meeting is, and then we put the new budget into our link there so they can see the March budget. So let, I'll accept the motion for accepting the, uh, um, what do you call it, in, not the interim, budget adjustments for 14, 15, and we can have questions. I move to accept the March budget adjustment. Moved second. by Pam, seconded by Scott. Uh, questions or comments? I just, I just have one, just to make sure I'm abundantly clear. The biggest variable for the rest of this year is that 600,000 some dollars budgeted for the anticipated variance. Yeah, that would You've be. You've soaked up a lot of the historic variance by knowing where you're at now. Yeah. And that leaves little room out of, left. Out of the hundreds of counts up, there's a small amount of dollars that add up. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Any others? <coughs> Seeing none, I'll call. We don't have to do a roll call on this, do we? I'll call for a voice vote. All in favor of adopting the, the, the amended budget, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> the ayes have it. <coughs> Move on to FFO, and we have a committee meeting minutes. <coughs> All right, so I'll read the minutes. Um, yep. March 9th, 2015, the FFO meeting. Um, Member Singer, Brandstadt, Wasserman, Charo, Cooper, and Lowe were present. Mrs. Lowe presented the January financial reports. No unusual items were noted. The financial reports will be included in the March 16th Board of Education agenda for approval. February financials were not available at this meeting, but will be shared as soon as they are available. Food service contract renewal, the renewal of the second year of the five-year contract with Chartwells to provide food service to the district was presented. Food service renewals must meet approval of the Michigan Department of Education. Our renewal was approved by the department and awaits board approval at the March 16th Board of Education meeting. The AONEO audit renewal, information attached, the annual uh, engagement letter from EONEO for the 2014-15 audit was presented to the FFO committee. The engagement letter communicates the auditor's responsibilities in a financial audit and outlines the firm's plans and procedures in performing that audit. The fee for the audit will not exceed $26,800. Best Practices Resolution Section 22F of the School of the State School Aid Act provides $50 per pupil one-time grant to districts that 
satisfy at least seven of the nine best practices criteria no later than June 1st of 2015, approval by roll call vote of the board um, of the resolution is required to qualify. March adjustments, the March budget adjustments were discussed. The adjustments will be presented at the March 16th board meeting for approval. Initial bond financials, work on the initial bond financials has begun. Planning and design work has also had its kickoff meeting. Next FFO meeting will be Monday, April 13th at 5 o'clock. <coughs> Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, I had it back about. Yeah, yeah. This information I'll give us tonight, and uh, I'll read them all in the sake of time, but don't want to downplay any of them. Uh, a couple of them at the top don't have uh, costs associated with them, but it uh, looks like we're in the trailer business here lately, I know. Mm -hmm. But this is the Midland High Robotics team with the trailer that they've been able to purchase and then Excellent. donate to the schools. And we have a uh, local scientist and gifted local artist who, who has given us some artwork to display around the district. Um, as far as the monetary gifts down below, uh, they total 6877 They vary from uh, the Jefferson uh, Parent Advisory Committee to JPAC. Uh, we have uh, one from a orchestra endowment fund, and then we have a couple of uh, smaller ones that uh, we got a reading, one at Carpenter School, and additionally, two of them through the Midland County Youth <coughs> Action Council um, for a couple middle high teachers that had a couple mini grants working uh, nice. in the science area. And uh, they don't need your approval, it's just for information tonight. Thank you, Robert, and thank you to all the donors. Appreciate it. Moving on to HR, we have a study committee report from Scott. No? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's my, my bad interpretation. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll hand it to Gary. Thank you. We have some retirements to announce. Sally Barnhart, uh, paraprofessional at Adams Elementary. I mean, these are all at the end of the school year. Sally Fine, teacher at Plymouth Elementary. Deb Finn, teacher at Northeast Middle School. Cindy Krause, paraprofessional at East Lawn. Karen Lickfeld, paraprofessional at Northeast. Joanne Pabosik, teacher at Woodcrest Elementary, and Raylene Van Ever, professional at Jefferson Middle School. And we thank all of these people for their service to the Middle Public Schools. Secondly, we extend sincere sympathies to the family of uh, Mr. James Clark, who passed away on February 23rd. <coughs> Rich public uh, school history with Midland, career spanning 40 years. Wow. He began as an economics and speech teacher at Midland High School in 1951. <laughs> then moved into an administrative career as assistant principal at Central from 56 to 63. He was the original principal at Jefferson from 63 to 67, and then was the original principal at H.H. Wow. H. H. Dow from 67 <laughs> to 81. He completed his career as director of curriculum instruction, and he served in that post from 81 to 91. Mr. Clark touched the lives of many, many MPS students and staff during his Middle Public Schools career. His footprints definitely are on mm -hmm. Middle Public Schools. Wow. Yeah. Sympathy yeah. to his family. Wow. Um, moving on to the rest of the agenda. Uh, correspondence listed to to and from the board. Scheduled meetings are to and from the board. Take uh, special note of the April 20th budget workshop. And now we move to study discussion session and I'll start with Pam. <coughs> okay. Well, I'm excited to hear about how the basketball <coughs> game's going tonight in Cadillac for the Midland High School team, and uh, I was also excited to hear how well the swim team has uh, done with uh, two state records being broken. It was uh, very exciting to read in the paper. Um, the robotics district competition is this coming Friday, so uh, I will, will be looking forward to going to that. Um, Let's see, the Booster Bash is coming up Friday at six o'clock. So if you haven't gotten your tickets, um, you can get those online and that's a great organization to support. Uh, I, s I was very happy tonight to see all the support for um, our music, our mu music programs. And um, I, like I said earlier, caught myself shaking my head in agreement with a lot of what they said. It's a, uh, great programs. Um, so hopefully they feel a little bit more at ease after leaving here tonight. And uh, I know there's going to be some discussions uh, <coughs> in the coming weeks. 
Um, briefly, a lot of great presentations tonight. I thought this was a, a very um, talkative meeting, much more <laughs> than usual. Um, I, I do ap appreciate everybody that, that came today um, because, you know, like you said, it, it is a great program. And, and their, their plight definitely did not fall on deaf ears. Um, really like the logos. I'm looking forward to debating with everybody on, on who's going to pick <laughs> what and, and what we're going to go with. Um, most importantly, I thought, um, I really liked the Carpenter Street School presentation. Um, I just love those presentations. Uh, thank you so much to Alan and John, uh, who were the volunteer mentors that came tonight. Uh, very proud of Michael and Noah and uh, their mom, Stephanie and Jennifer, for stepping up and supporting them because you know they need help. And it, we're really blessed to have members in our community like Alan and John who are willing to give their time to make sure that our kids succeed. Um, and that's really all I wanted to say. Oh, encouraging news about the um, budget. So that was that was nice to hear. Um, and that's it. So thanks. Angela. All right. Well, I think you two took a lot of what I was going to say, but <coughs> I did get the opportunity to spend my weekend at the um, D2 state swim meet, and we were very well represented. <coughs> we had 11 students or 11 um, young men from Dow High who competed, and we also had one student from Midland High who competed, and it was a fabulous weekend. So um, we have that, and looking forward to the Booster Bash this coming weekend. It's always a good time. I think we've been every single year, um, and um, that's all. There's really nothing I can add. I just wanted to say I enjoyed the presentations, the students, of course, the logos were great, and the mentoring program, that was great to hear about, too. Lots of information tonight, lots of things to think about, lots of information to digest, so I'll leave it at that. Just wanted to say I thanked all the, the people and parents who are here tonight for the music, um, music concerns and issues. It's that same passion that they bring out is what allows us to pass things like our bond proposal. That's, like, it's nice of the community where you have that kind of passion for our education. Uh, quickly, I spent last Saturday briefly at Midland High for Pi Day. They um, <laughs> unveiled a brand new uh, piece of art. So now the you know, school's more alive. There's a, they, they took Pi to over 1,100 places on the mural by their math, de math department. Uh, I'm a numbers guy, so I, I appreciate that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> nice to see. Appreciate the kids and all the ma great math teachers, great students. Nice to see. Uh, good Pi, too. So. <laughs> 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 uh, I think... Everything else has since been discussed here. So. And, and mine is a shout out to Midlink community. Um, on many fronts, uh, I was very gratified, first of all, by the whole community support of the millage. It showed that our town really values education and uh, willing to put their money where their mouth is in that regard. Same tonight with the music parents. It just shows the intensity of our community's feelings on our programs and our kids. And even the logos represented that, mm -hmm. the excellence, the mm -hmm. community. It's all about community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if there's one thing I could change, and it's not worth the effort, it, it would be to call it Midland Community Schools versus Midland Public Schools. It just gives you a better sense of what that means uh, the, versus the public entity. It's our community rallying together to make our schools and, and, and do good things for our kids. Booster Bash is another one. You know, it, it, all this stuff is all about the Midland community. So, um, and then secondly, when we were on the, on the, tours for the millage, one of the things I came to recognize was how much of our community does not understand or realize our proportion of at-risk population we have and the programs and energy that our teachers and staff and everybody else have to put into those interventions to bring all kids along. You know, our averages have shown all kids keep moving, so everybody's kind of oblivious to the the duck paddling under the surface to make that all happen very hard. And the Carpenter presentation is a nice little segment of that. And uh, uh, we've got to keep making every kid better. And I'm just so pleased to see that and the efforts we put into that. For me, um, school zone designation and Saginaw Road in front of Dow High. I think ah, everybody yes. probably yes. sees it uh, there, and, and the credit really does go to the city engineering department. Um, the, the, he's done a great job of working on that, so it was nice to hear that last week. Um, Mill School. So we've, you know, we've kind of knew um, there was a gentleman looking at this for a homeless shelter. But we really wanted to see what happened on February 24th, and so um, and now we've met with him. Um, 
we need assurances that he has funding. Um, we need a lot of legal assurances of what would occur with the school if we did work with him and it didn't work somewhere down the road, what would occur with that. So lots to do there, but I gave, gave you informed that there's interest in mills and, and um, we'll work that through before we ever think of um, proceeding with the bond to, to take it down. So we'll see where that goes when we go forward and I'll keep you up to date, but there is interest in there. Um, have did speak to the supervisor out there. Um, they don't have issues if it's a homeless shelter, but they have the same concerns we have about is there true funding behind it and what would occur um, if it didn't come through for us as well. Uh, we are in the negotiation season, so I ask for everyone's patience as we go through that, and that sometimes can be a painful process, particularly when we're talking probably about a concessionary contract. Um, bond facility update, we've had a couple meetings at this point. Moving forward, um, I can tell you just very little on the actual um, what the, what's going to occur there. It looks like they're looking at boiler rooms in the middle schools as energy saving first projects low design that, that can be done this summer and it looks like um, central uh, the campus the work will begin probably next Christmas mm -hmm. and so we need to do, we got a bunch of work to begin to figure out uh, where we're going to move all the programs that occur in Central Auditorium because we'll be out of there for 18 months because of the amount of work, the asbestos and the paint mm -hmm. and um, the work that needs to occur there. So um, we get some work to do to figure out what we're going to do, um, where we're going to go for the auditorium as well as our science center that's now put into that building. We <laughs> thought we could leave them um, and tent them off, kind of, so to speak, and it doesn't sound like there's a good scenario. So we got some work to do going ahead on that. Uh, and that's all I've got for tonight. Okay. I'm going to cut a little short so we can finish. Yep. I'll mm -hmm. take a motion to go to closed session. Yes. I move we go to closed session. Second. Moved by Angela, support by Scott. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And when we come for the public, when we come back to open session, I highly anticipate we will just be adjourning the meeting. <laughs> right. Okay, so if I clear the room and we'll start immediately when the doors are closed. session and we are now adjourning the meeting.